All right, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Castro Valley Unified School District Special Board meeting on reopening of schools and information. I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call. Vice President Lee. Here. Um, Trustee Theodore. Here. Trustee Joe Loss. Present. Trustee Howard. We'll wait till he can hear us. Looks like he's trying to connect his audio. He just sent me a text that his microphone and speaker aren't working. Um, maybe have him call in Harry, separately. Call in. And as we're all waiting, you can see that we are um, aware that we all face technical difficulties during this time and it happens and that's okay. We don't see him in the call list. And as soon as we connect um, Gary Howard to audio, we will go ahead and get started. Or maybe just hang up, hang up later and rejoin maybe. Sometimes that helps. Calls in and pushes the number. I can pull them over over on the phone. And for those of you who are just joining us, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties and we will get short, uh, started momentarily. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank yeah. you. Gary. Thank you <laughs> Trustee Howard, are you present? Yes. I, yes, you can hear us. So I can hear you through my telephone, but I can't hear you through my computer for some reason. We'll make it work. Whatever. <laughs> we are all present and accounted for. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for the Castro Valley Unified uh, School District Special Board Meeting on school opening and potential options. Um, approval of the agenda. Have there been any changes, um, Superintendent Amadi? No changes. Great. This is an action item. I'll move approval of the agenda as presented. No second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So for public comments, for those of you who are with us, we do have quite a few folks on the line. We want to let you know that the board respects and encourages the public to comment on matters on the board agenda and within the board's jurisdiction. The board fully supports civil discourse and requests that everyone respect each other and their point of view. Individuals who would like to address the board must raise your hand during the start of the agenda item. To comment by video conference, click the raise your hand button and to comment by phone by pressing star nine to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comment. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Individual speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes. There are up to 30 minutes of public comment allowed on each agenda item. With board consensus, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed. And so everyone knows this meeting is being recorded to prepare for the official minutes. And we will move on to item two, discussion items, uh, discuss and approve the phased recommendations for safety reopening schools per the roadmap to reopening and safety plan. Now, before we get started, and I pass it over to Parveen Amati, um, we did receive comments. We wanna let everybody know that we did read them um, for those who had commented prior and sent over emails. So we thank you for that. And we know that there are many people going through many different things um, and that the community has asked us to look at things further and um, there'll be a lot we, we will talk tonight about. Um, so we're looking forward to this presentation. Superintendent Amadi. Thank you so much. Lavender, we've lost Gary again. Oh, oh really? No. Yeah. I think he's trying to log off all the way and log back on. Yeah. At least that's what I texted him to try and do. Okay, well, we will pause here <laughs> and wait for Gary to get back on. Thank you for that notification. I was reading. And I'll have uh, Ms. Kayer to go ahead and start the presentation as soon as he joins and then we'll get started. And again, for those joining us, we're having slight technical difficulties and we will start or continue momentarily. Thank you.
Looks like he's trying to get back on. There he is. Sorry, I'm back, I think. Can you hear us, Gary? I can hear you now, thanks. Sorry, to I don't know what happened. Great, and then just a clarification on the agenda so everybody knows, um, opening meeting uh, D public comment is to let everybody know how to public comment. Um, not actually we're taking public comment on item uh, 1D. It's We'll take it um, to after the presentation and we'll give everybody a chance to speak before we uh, confer further and make a decision. So I just wanted everybody to know that there was a little bit of confusion there. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know the difference. So given that, thank you back, Gary. Uh, we will continue with item two discussion items and I will hand it over to Superintendent Amadi. Thank you. Um, we'll get started with our presentation, but I just, uh, again, as a reminder, reiterating what uh, Trustee um, uh, Whitaker just mentioned, we're gonna do our presentation um, and then we'll have board questions if you have any clarification as I go through the presentation or at the end, just if you have any uh, couple of questions that um, you have. And then after that, we'll listen to comments and then come back to the board for um, discussion and possible action. So I wanna start, um, let's go to the next slide. I, I, I actually uh, like to start us off um, without even going through um, this slide saying, I think it's really important for us to know that none of us have a crystal ball. Um, and I think as a board, you have done an outstanding job supporting um, all of the efforts in, this, in the district to keep everyone safe. We have worked very hard to keep um, the safety of our staff who are already on site and our students who are on site um, as our absolute number one priority. I think we've always been, you've been very thoughtful and I know that whatever decisions we, you um, decide um, upon tonight or in the future, we always have, you know, all sides of the same, you know, the same issue. People um, have different circumstances. And I just want, um, I want, I hope that people will join me in appreciating um, how hard this has been for all of you as board members making very important decisions with the information that we have and based on health and science and all of the great information that we've had and the support we've had from the health department in Alameda County. So um, again, we're, we've been very cautious and careful and that's how we want to pursue every decision that we make around this, uh, the COVID uh, you know, issues that we're dealing with. So important reminders ahead of time, ahead of tonight's conversation. Um, as you have all heard, COVID cases are rising in Alameda County statewide and nationally. That's just a well-known fact and we knew that was going to happen. Uh, how we react to that is going to determine how bad it's gonna get. So I know that all of us are gonna do our very best in Alameda County, I hope uh, to get us back on track. Um, I also wanted to remind us that a thoughtful, cautious approach to reopening is critical and that's what we have been doing. Um, recommendations are, are that we, you see in our presentation and the conversation we have are really predicated on the health order remaining the same, meaning that it's based on um, their recommendations of the health department and all the, and they have been very cautious that it stays, um, that we are allowed to remain open. If any of that changes, obviously what we do changes um, right after that, um, immediately based on that directive. Um, there is a high probability that Alameda County slips back into previous tiers, we know that. Uh, challenges with distance learning for student groups remain a huge, huge concern. I have to say, we're extremely concerned as we take a look at grades and, and the gap that students have had in their learning. As hard, um, I know that our teachers and staff have worked really, really hard to, um, you know, to, to tackle the challenges, but it is not the same. We already knew that. 
Um, yeah. You have, I know you're going to mention it later, and it, it says it within throughout the the um, slide deck, but the high probability that Alameda slips back, just the, just to reiterate that things could change and that, you know, even if we're looking at rolling back in and that we have a phased approach, we, if we make a decision tonight that that could change because of what happens outside and what the direction is from the health department in cases. So I just want to make sure that everybody's listening, that they realize that, you know, we're looking at this if it's safe to go back, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and, and, I, and that's really my fourth bullet was about that. You, we have to recognize that each district is making decisions, but those decisions need to be based on what we are getting from the health department. So if it if we slip back, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, later on. Um, the other piece that we need to, I want to remind all of us is that um, families appreciate advanced planning and timeline. I mean, uh, th it, this is something we have heard from many, many of our families. Um, and we're working collaboratively uh, with CVTA to complete negotiations. So we're doing that work. We And I think sometimes I hear from folks um, that, why haven't that started? We have been working on it. We've been working on all of these things. It's not that we started just now. So everyone's been working as hard as they can. Um, I also, I am hoping that folks on the call actually um, really um, hopefully hear everything that we're talking about because oftentimes when we hear comments, um, I'm seeing the same thing that we said, uh, repeat it. We've already, I, I wanna be real clear that um, like President Whitaker said, that we're basing our decision on what we have now. And if we slip back into um, a, a tier that makes it very difficult for the health department, for our hospitals to be managing COVID, we will be told to do it differently. And, and we'll have to do that. Reopening and safety plan needs to be reviewed by Alameda County Health Department and ACOE. Um, so these site specific implementations take time and great effort. And I wanna thank our teams for putting that together. Um, and I think with the, the idea in mind that at some point we're gonna have to open our schools and we want to, we wanna be ready for that. Uh, next slide, please stop me along the way if you have any questions or comments, um, if you have any questions. <laughs> Options to consider tonight. So I um, added this because I want to make sure that we kind of start our conversation um, with everybody understanding. We have three options to consider tonight. Uh, approve the current listed phases and dates recommended that we have worked very hard on since the last time. I want to remind everyone, the reason we are here tonight is because at the last board meeting, not the board workshop, we did hear and we continue to hear from families, please, do not wait till January 13th. That's what we heard. We also had this survey that 4,000 people actually took and 75% of the folks um, who responded actually said uh, they would like to um, send their children back to school when we have it, when it's possible. And, um, and then the board asked us, gave us direction to come back. So this is why we're here tonight because um, the conversation the, the, uh, in October was to wait till January 13th, but having additional information, including the fact that the health department said we can also open secondary schools, also the survey, also hearing from folks, um, it was uh, asked that we come back so you can consider. So, Three options, approve the current list phases and dates recommended if any changes. Consider and approve an alternative timeline with later start and more time in between phases. That's something that I know um, I've been given some, we've been given some thought to, or discuss phases and dates of reopening on January 13th. So all th three options are on the table, uh, but we uh, followed your direction and came back with what you had asked us to bring to you. Next slide. Okay, this is the slide we always have. And 
We always, our wish is to be in yellow at some point in the future, but right now we're in orange. However, we're, there's a pretty good possibility that we will slip back into red. Um, I do want to say um, in a couple of um, slides for uh, ne next couple of slides, I will go over that. But this is where we are right now. Next slide. This is what you've seen before. We're just kind of updating it. Thank you, Amy. Next slide. So press release that came out today, November 12th, uh, regarding uh, pausing further opening of activities. What we have heard from the uh, Alameda County Health Officer, Dr. Moss and his team has always been it's uh, the importance of opening schools and the impact on families um, has been huge. So with that in mind, they have been very thoughtful. And when they talk about going back and moving things back, that there are um, other um, things that they will look at closing and tightening before schools, because the, the, the kinds of um, commu uh, community um, spread that's happening in some of the other venues um, are high risk. So we have heard that Alameda County is currently in orange tier um, based on the state blueprint, but we know that we have we can go into red soon. If we go from orange to red, it will not impact school reopening as schools are allowed to reopen in the red tier. There's also, um, it, we also wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we would have to slip back into purple before school reopening would be impacted. And depends on when that is and when schools are reopened. Next slide. Updates um, that we wanted to just share with you in general. There are some great things happening. I think we forget that <laughs> this is not the only thing we're working on. Um, students are being taught, things are happening. We're doing all this work. Um, and uh, we had a very successful free flu clinic, 12, 100 people, actually almost 1,300 people received flu shots. I put that in here. What does that have to do with COVID? It's because what we're hearing from the health department, we encourage folks to get their flu shots. So we wanted to do our part in, in uh, collaboration and partnerships with the health department, our awesome nurses, adult school, custodian, principal, vice principal, everybody helped to get this um, started and we wanna continue to be careful. Hubs at every school are open. They're going well um, with additional hubs starting, um, starting soon on some of our sites. Site-specific reopening plans. Remember that reopening plan um, and reopening uh, roadmap and safety plan that we have had in place that you have looked through and, and have um, seen and have said that you're very happy with. That now has to be actually what we implement. And we have put together a checklist and a, a, and a template for each school. And they're working on making that happen and actually doing the physical, um, you know, the, the implementation is, the plan is one thing, but the implementation is what we really are focusing on right now. For example, signs, moving things around, thinking about all the things, all the what ifs. So those are happening right now. Negotiations are in process and we're in constant communication with the uh, health department and Alameda County Office of Education. Um, COVID testing contract is completed and we do have training and implementation for COVID testing um, in progress. So those are all things that are happening. Next. So recommendations on tiered um, reopening plans all recommendations are predicated on health orders remaining the same. I want to repeat that. Rationale for making decision in November, what we heard from, from you and based on that, um, staffing and funding implication implications that we have, depending on when we open, we really do need to look at what kind of, um, you know, is there additional staffing that we need? When is it? How many students will, um, you know, will be moving between programs. That was one of the reasons um, that you heard 
Um, our team actually, the first semester ends in December. And for that reason, we had mentioned, we had let families know in high school that if there's a change from virtual to Castro Valley High School and back and forth and vice versa, that does need to happen at the semester's end. So for families to know when we reopen, that's important because then they can make their decision. If they honestly cannot and due to whatever reasons they have, um, cannot have their children come back to school, then they need to make that decision because moving back and forth within uh, during the semester makes it very difficult for our teachers and students and staff and administrators. So we wanted to make sure they have that option. Um, for middle and high school, we had said make your decision at the beginning of the year because it's a different story. Um, but we still want to make sure families know that and if there are um, additional circumstances that have come forward that we need to consider and move kids back and forth, we need to do that because all of those things will take tons of time. Uh, time to communicate and train for staff and families, training for staff and families. We are gonna have some time. Um, we're gonna need some time to work with our families and staff to train them about coming back. Everything is on paper, everything for us, much of what we need to do is in place but having people to actually move through things and do things is a different story. And then families need information to plan, daycare, time, work, and then time to practice. So these are just some of the things um, that we um, wanted to consider as we put this recommendation together. Again, only if the health order remains the same. Next. So this is a, a recommendation. I wanna thank our ed educational services, our human resources, our business division who have worked really, really hard the last, again, few uh, couple of weeks to get this together. Our principals have met over and over again and looked at many, many things. And they really have looked at, um, their rationale was very clear about why a certain grade needs to go before another one. Um, and I think that's, I, I wanna um, really acknowledge all that hard work. So what we were looking at was January 11th because we, we don't wanna start the first week we come back. We wanna make sure that we have kids back first. January 11th for grades four and five. Um, and then January 18th, we understand these are the week of. So it's not on January 18th, it's the, it's the week of January 18th because January 18th, is actually um, Dr. King's uh, birthday and we celebrate that and we are not in school. Um, so that week for grades two and three, and you also have um, all of the special education programs listed as well as preschool. Um, so, and then phase three for grades K-1 and then TK. Um, next slide. Before you go yes. forward, there's a question on the last slide. Um, um, you talked about those grades going first. And can you share a little bit about the rationale that people, I mean, why four or five first and why only moderate at yes. Proctor and why moderate severe at Chabot and Benoit? Yes, I, I will do that. But you know what I'm going to need? I'm going to need my wonderful assistant. Uh, Amy, if you could print out, because I should have printed that out. I had the rationale in front of me. And I, oh, so no, that's fine. Print it out. No, I, I think print it's, out. Yeah, it's really important. But let me say something about the special day classes. So the reason you have names is because we have different kinds of programs at different schools. So um, if you see moderate to severe at Chabot, um, that then when you look down, you will see that's where we have the K2 program. So that's why it's very specific. Um, and then we go to mild to moderate. So and, and some of the reasons for those, and, and um, I think uh, Dr. Ryman can jump in at any time as well. Um, I, I think we, they really looked at what would be the best to start with to make sure that we have a successful opening uh, before we go to the next group. Um, but I will go over some of the rationale, um, some of the things I remember. I think one of the 
things for grades four and five. Um, they are a lot more, well, they're older, right? Uh, they're older and thank you, Amy. Um, and starting with the oldest students kind of gives each school an opportunity to be successful from the beginning. Um, because with fourth and fifth graders, you can actually have more conversations around why, and they can be great examples for their younger brothers and sisters. The students are older. They already know many of the regular school rules already. You know, for transitional kindergarten, they've never been to school yet. That takes a lot more training <laughs> than grades four and five. We want to have success up front with practice. Um, upfront success will allow us to kind of stick with our timeline, bringing the next group in. They also felt that parents of upper grade students may feel more comfortable sending their children to school versus little ones. Um, according to a recent parent survey, we also um, know that the social emotional toll on the students have all grades have been tremendous, but we're hearing a lot from older um, students. The current learning support hub experiences that we've had uh, lead us to believe that starting with higher grades, because that's what we have most of, uh, will support beginning more successfully uh, to continue. And um, they've been our pilots. So those are some of the rationales. Again, kind of starting with the older students versus younger students and transitional K, K is going to need a lot more time uh, to just set routines that they've never had in school. Um, they've been to preschool, but this is very different. Any other questions about that slide? Dr. Raman has his hands up. Dr. Raman? I, I was just going to, to add to what uh, Superintendent Amadi was sharing. Also that we're a district that has the luxury of having had pods that have been open for some time now. And so that data is available to us where other school districts might not have that feedback yet. Uh, so it's, it's an additional piece where um, I think the board make good decisions in terms of letting us bring students back earlier in pods. Yeah, I thank you for saying that. I, I really actually, um, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm seeing on TV, oh, such and such school district started two hubs or is going to start two hubs in the next two weeks they're going to have testing protocols. I'm like, we've already had that. We've had four weeks almost of hubs in every single one of our schools. So I really, I think um, it's really important to acknowledge all the good work that has been done. And again, thank you to the board for actually thinking ahead and agreeing to some of these ideas that we bring to you um, as allowed by the health department. So, um, and at the bottom of the chart, it does say uh, the RSP resource program uh, is aligned with general ed phases, obviously, because they are in general ed. Okay, next. So then that would bring us to phase five for grade six. One of the reasons that um, our team wanted to have grade six um, go first, it's because sixth graders will return in their cohorts, two co cohorts starting February 1st for cohort A, remember it's the AB schedule, and then February 4th for cohort B. Um, they can become more familiar with what really the campus and their classes, because this is their first time again on campus, unless they've been in the hub. And support staff will have an opportunity to use the new procedures and protocols with just a smaller group uh, to get better at it, um, to make sure we uh, kind of work out any um, issues that we have um, to uh, modify or change. Then and grade seven, eight. Um, so I, I was gonna say, Parveen, grade six and nine, those are critical years, correct? Like if we yes. don't help them out because the transition from elementary to middle school and middle school to high school is such, such a hard transition, then we, you know, there's a lot of supports that are needed during that time frame. Is that part of the rationale as well? Absolutely. Again, our ninth graders, um, you know, this is their first year. They haven't been on campus just to bring them back. And although we had um, distant learning orientation, the student orientation for safety protocols would be great. And um, it's a smaller group so that we can bring them in. And obviously then phase seven 
which would be February 8th, um, would be grade 7, 8, and 10, 11, and 12, again, with RSB students in general ed. Um, let's see, next slide. Welcome, Shane. Oh, um, Trustee Lee, I think, had a question. Uh, Trustee Lee. Sorry, trying to find the unmute button. So I assume at the end of each week, like, we'll be evaluating and assessing what's happened, what's going well, what's not working, whether we're getting positive COVID tests back or um, something like that before we go on to the next phase. Yeah, so I have to say, we wouldn't be bringing every week back to the board. You, that's our job. We would do that. We track and trace. And if anything happens, um, we have very clear protocols that say, for example, if you have this kind of case, this number of cases that you close this, you quarantine everybody. All of those things are a part of our reopening plan, which the health department has given us and has have trained us. But yes, we would be looking at it, not just weekly, we would be looking at that daily, on a daily basis, honestly, to make sure everything is in place. Um, and that if we have any cases that we're actually looking at, um, you know, looking at what we need to do and following all the protocols before we move to the next one. So one of the things we have said from the very beginning is that we will need to be ready to pivot. And we have done so, um, and that's what we need to continue to do. One of the other things I wanted to um, share with you is that um, the, the districts, before we go to questions, other districts in, in the county are also, um, some of them are making decisions this week and some of them have already made decisions. And for those who have made decisions such as San Leandro, Pleasanton, Albany, and um, some of the other ones, uh, they are kind of on the same track as the elementary schools starting in January. Now that was, you know, this is what has been decided. Again, I am absolutely sure they would also be looking at what happens if we go back to purple um, and things like that. So that's the rec that was the recommendation we brought to you. And if you go back to the beginning of the slide, when we talked about three options, one option is that. One option is for you to consider and say, could we start ma backward mapping from high school later on and back and perhaps even more time in between each phase, like instead of one week, two weeks. So we've given that some thought um, as well, if that's something that you wanna hear more about. And of course, just waiting till January. So are there any questions before we go to public comment? I keep thinking trustee um, Biro has questions, <laughs> but it's just behind, it's the, your background. <laughs> It's uh, Trustee Locke. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, you mentioned uh, that we're having collaborative negotiations and negotiations are ongoing. Um, but as we look at these plans, I'm gonna ask you a really hard question. Are we in a point where we know that we're gonna have staff to reopen? So we, <clears throat> we've been working very hard. I can, um, I, I guess, Dr. Beats, if you want to say a few words, but I can tell you that um, we've been collaborating, we've been working, and that is something we need to make sure gets done um, as soon as possible, because we, what we want to do is, regardless of when we open in January or February, it's important to have everything in place and be sure that we have what we need. And we can't, you know, just waiting to set things up physically in schools until we actually are ready to start is not a very smart move for on our part. Um, as far as negotiations go, I know that everybody wants to get this done. So Dr. Beats. Yeah, so we've, we've been meeting with CBTA weekly. Um, we have, we're pretty close to finishing up the elementary phase because we, our thought was that elementary would go back first. So we've made major headway there and um, are very, very close. 
Um, we, we have given them uh, CBTA an initial proposal on secondary. So we're starting to work on that. And again, we're meeting tomorrow. Um, so yes, that's where we are with negotiations in terms of staff. Um, our initial request is if staff members knew that they did not want to return to in-person that they applied to work in the virtual academy. So as difficult as it was moving people around right before school started, we did channel those people into the virtual academy with the kids that wanted to be in the virtual academies. Um, we anticipate we may get some more health requests and um, as is an employee statutory right, anyone that has a health condition or medical condition uh, that puts them at risk, we would certainly enter, you know, and meet with them and engage in the interactive process, talk about what their options are, their rights are, and um, it'll be a you know one-to-one -one individual option for employees um, that we will work with them. It is their right if they have a medical condition to seek other alternatives and we can see what they are. They will vary for each individual depending on their restrictions. So that's where we are with the staffing as well as negotiations. Thank you, Sherry. Don't, did have her hand raised? Yes. So then what actually happens if we reach January 11th and we don't have an agreement? Well, we, if we don't have staff, um, we will, we would open, but we wouldn't have staff. I don't, I mean, the answer is we need staff to open. And that's why we have put everything that's required by the health department and even things that are recommended to as much as we have, we have everything that's required already. So really our conversations have been collaborative about what are some things to clarify to just make sure we're in the right place. Because I can tell you our teachers are working really hard on distance learning and I know that they would wanna be back when possible as well. Um, it's, this is not easy on them, um, nor is it easy on our students or families or classified. So um, that's, that's where we are. But, it's a great question and I think it's really, this is why it's important to continue and finish the conversation so we can be done um, with that piece as well as all the safety things that we have put in place. I do wanna say something about the virtual academy. I don't know of any other district that actually has done the virtual academy that has the kind of virtual academy we have. We have like 1300 kids in it. And a lot of other school districts are gonna to have to reshuffle the entire program when they open. So this is why I really wanna caution people and say, this is why we want you to know that we will at some point, whether it be January, February or March, we're gonna open schools, even if it's March. So if you feel like you will not send your children to school at all this year, it is really important to make that decision to have made that decision before, but if there's some new circumstances, we need to do that now. So, um, <laughs> Trustee Theodore had another question. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say that to uh, Trustee Theodore, part of the reason we've spent so much time in negotiations is discussing the safety protocols, because obviously that's important to everybody so that staff will be safe when they return. Um, so. Dot, you had your hand raised and I know Joe came off mute, so Dot and then, no, okay, Dot. Yeah, I, I just also know that there have been concerns from community members about the virtual academy, so you, you just answered that. Thanks. Thank you. And then I know, uh, as mentioning, when we, I'll get Monica next, um, this, to Dot's point and, you know, again, in the negotiations and as we're talking to families, we keep saying that things change, we'll notify. So. A lot of people wondering how do they find this information out? Um, so reiterating, where do families go to find that information and how will we notify people if we're getting close to the date, if we decide to go back, that we have to delay? What will that look like? Yeah, so we constantly send newsletters home, letters home. We also have um, Parent Square now that folks get texts and emails from, we will continue to give them as much information as we have been doing and more and more. 
we would let everyone know ahead of time. Um, and I think um, one of the things that I was very happy about is on that survey, the vast majority of the folks, I don't have the um, percentage right now in front of me, but I know that um, when Amy and I were looking at that, that the vast majority of the folks are saying the kind of communication they're getting has been sufficient and they've been very happy. So we will post it, we will have it on our website. There's tons of information on our website, but we would definitely communicate with the families. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, I'm just curious, just in terms of something that might provide us guidance. Um, it's my understanding that Contra Costa County has gone back, backwards, I guess, what is it, red right before orange? And that at least some of their districts, because um, I have a friend whose kids are in San Ramon, um, have gone back to school. Have you talked with any of the superintendents about what's going on there or or so just some if if you have because I know you all you superintendents speak regularly um, maybe it could give us some guidance too as to what's going on with their schools and how bringing kids back is working yeah those who have opened um, are doing really well there were a couple of private schools in Morin when they had to shut it down for other reasons but the public schools that have opened um, have been very cautious, very careful. I haven't heard of any public school, at least I haven't, there may be, um, of any, any public schools that have opened and have had to close. There aren't too many around us, but in the state, I know that uh, Dr. Beats have also, um, has also heard about that, um, that in several other areas away from us, the schools have actually been open. So it's been, I think people have put in place great procedures and processes. Um, what we are hearing is if schools are not open, right? If schools are not open, let's say in whatever, District A, and we go into purple, they won't be allowed to open until we get out of purple into red. But if you're already open and it goes into purple, they're not gonna close your school unless there are certain number of cases in a group of kids or in a grade level or in a school. So there, all those procedures are already in place. Great questions. Are there any other questions um, from the board before I go to public comment? Shane? I just wanted to clarify one thing real quick. So if we have already reopened, and for some reason, the cases go back to like the purple zone, but we haven't had any cases in the school. The school continue to be open. Okay, just make yes, sure. Yes, and they, and great question. And they continue, they will work with us. Our nurses and the health department are in sync about with this, all this communication. Um, you know, and really high school and middle school, for example, all, always because of how it's set up because you're not with one teacher, obviously has its own challenges. So, but there are procedures and protocols for each one of those scenarios. Um, you know, how many cases, where, and all of that. Monica? I know this is sort of getting ahead of ourselves, but um, hopefully too, if, if they come up with a vaccine, which it seems like, they're kind of predicting might be available by spring. I don't know if we'll be able to do a, a clinic like the flu clinic, because it sounds like what they've got now requires such extreme storage conditions. It may not work, but hopefully it's something we'll keep in mind and, and yeah. make, be able to make available to the community. Yeah, so if the question is, can we do that? So we've done the flu clinic uh, every year. Um, I'm not sure if, when and if the vaccine becomes available, we would be able to do the same, but I can tell you this, we would jump up and down and say, we'll do it. So we do have amazing nurses, two nurses, um, and we also have, you know, just support staff and the space, and we have a really good relationship with the, with the health department and the hospital um, here as well. So um, that's a great question. So in case that's an opportunity, we will absolutely work on making that happen. 
So it sounds like all the questions were answered. So if you want to go to comments. Oh, the other question. Henry. <laughs> so I realize I'm bringing up something that the ship has sailed on this, but I'm struggling with this decision because I think fundamentally the AMPM model and the AB that's every other day versus the 10-4 that we decided on are both bad. Um, so while I do believe that we can go back safely at some point, I don't think we can with the models that we've chosen. I, I, I know that's not a question, so I'm gonna wait till um, to respond, but I have to tell you, if we have to go back to look at those models, I have no idea how many more hours and time we need. It took many, many days. Our administrators and teachers worked really hard to come up with that. So I would highly encourage you, as much as you might not all agree, but it was approved. And I would say, I, I agree with you that ship has sailed. I think we should leave it alone because our staff honestly is working above and beyond to get just what we have done right now. So I would really highly encourage us not to um, to, to go there because I can just see <laughs> gray hair. Coming. All right, so I think we're good with questions. Thanks. And we do have um, more questions in the 30 minutes. So if it's okay with the board, just wanna uh, see if we can reduce the individual time to two and a half minutes and then increase our time to uh, 45 minutes instead of 30. Is that okay with everyone? Just thumbs up. Great. All right, so what we will do is I will take comments in the order that they are received. And so first, we move some stuff around on my page so I can see hands raising. First, I will bring over Chris, Chris uh, Crowell followed by Nicole C. Chris, are you with yes. us? Yes, I am here. Great, please um, proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, well, I just was gonna say, I, I actually share Dot's concern. I really liked the 10-4 model, so I'm disappointed to hear that um, the district is saying, nope, we're done. we're done looking at models, we got what we got. So that makes the questions of exactly when to reopen, um, I guess a little more important, <laughs> um, uh, or I, it makes me want to be a little more cautious. And um, uh, I was also surprised to hear that if the schools are open and we go into purple, that the schools would continue to stay open as long as the case numbers don't rise among the certain amount. So I thought that was a little um, strange. Uh, um, and um, uh, another thing, when I was going, it wasn't part of the presentation, but I was going through the information, uh, and I just wanted to say uh, there was two samples of different screening questions, and just wanted to say, really choose your screening questions carefully, because it's really important that people are honestly answering them and taking them seriously. But one of those screening questions was written so broadly that... Um, you know, and it says, if you answer yes to this question, don't send your kid to school. And you'd have to answer yes anytime anybody in your family had a sniffles like in the past two weeks or had a headache in the last two weeks. So if a question is so broad like that and the consequences are so severe, people are not gonna take those screening questions seriously. So um, please make something <laughs> that's appropriate and that will really actually work as best as possible. Um, and I guess that's I'm running out of things, but I also noticed with special ed, there's a lot of still open questions. So who and when and where are those going to get answered? It says, make sure to address this issue, address that issue. We need to address those issues now. And I still don't know when and how. And I really hope you include families in those decisions. And it's not just district of personnel, but work with the families. Every case is going to be different with those families. Um, so that's really critical to me, too. So thank you. Chris, I'm going to um, move you over. I'm going to bring over Nicole, followed by uh, Taya. Nicole, 
Nicole, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Um, so I am uh, the parent of a first and fourth grader and eighth grader, but I'm not as concerned about the eighth grader. Um, in terms of logistics, because you have fourth and fifth starting first, and I wasn't 100% clear, but I think I heard um, Superintendent Amadi say that, you know, we would do the AM, PM. Um, so I was wondering, like, why wouldn't we start all elementary with the AM, PM? Um, just because of, like I said, logistics of having the fourth grader start two weeks ahead of the first grader. Is there going to be like adventure time or any type of after school care? Because um, I'm considered an essential worker and I do have to leave the home. So I'm not able to remain at home with um, the first grader. So I just wanted to ask and maybe just express those kind of concerns about logistics um, for parents that have to work outside of the home. And that's, that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I'm going to mute your line. I'm going to bring over Tayeb, followed by Laura Sepulveda. Tayeb? Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak here. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody. Uh, I know you guys have put a lot of hard work into all of this. Um, I have two children that go to the uh, school district. Uh, my son is in uh, sixth and my daughter is in uh, senior in high school. Uh, my main concern is, uh, first of all, and I know I only have short time, so I'll speak a little fast. Uh, number one, uh, most of the schools that have opened so far, colleges included, they've went down. Uh, number of cases, as you already know, it has gone up, uh, especially with the announcement of the vaccine. Uh, many people are getting more relaxed. Uh, my daughter has type 1 diabetes. She is very susceptible to uh, COVID. The reason we had chosen the hybrid is because she, I, I wish uh, um, uh, Mr. Blaine Torpy was here, he would testify to this. Um, she's a really high achiever. She has uh, numerous advanced placement courses. Most of her classes are advanced placement and there is no choice for uh, virtual in that arena. Uh, to, to put a parent on the spot saying, You're, you can either have your daughter's education or you can have her life. Um, is not a very good choice to make. Uh, you know, you'll, the school board always speaks about equity and not equality. Well, this is where it comes into play. And with all due respect, President, uh, uh, Superintendent Amadi, just because a lot of people have put a lot of hard work and a lot of hours into a plan, that doesn't mean that that plan is the final best result. Best time to open up the schools. Uh, we have just gone into orange. We probably need more time. And as much as I waited 18 years to see my daughter walk on the stage on her graduation, I'd rather not see her walk on that stage and see her alive and well and succeed in college alive and well. The stress being put on the word well. Um, this just doesn't seem very right uh, where a parent has to make a choice that, hey, you, you can either send your daughter to uh, school or you can uh, keep her safe. Why can't we have both? We've been doing this this far. I'm sure we can hold off a little bit longer. I know I only have 10 seconds and I hope that you can increase my time. But if this is all I have, then this is all I have. And by the way, the 75% of the parents that were surveyed, they probably didn't have a child with type 1 diabetes. Thank you, Taya. I'm going to meet your line. I'm going to bring in Laura uh, Sepulveda followed mm -hmm. by Mark Mladenich. Laura, are you Hi. with us? Hi, um, my name is Lara Sepulveda and I am an eighth grade parent and a teacher at Creekside. And um, I have a couple of things that I'd like to bring up and some questions for the board to consider. So the first one is I really feel um, that 75% number that keeps being bandied about in terms of the survey data of parents that want their kids to return to school is flawed we were only given two choices, return or not to return. And I know that many parents reached out to both the board and people in the district and have a lot of whens that they wanted to see added, 
when there's a vaccine, when it's safe, when I feel comfortable. So I think that 75% is not accurate. It seems like there's a rush to reopen prior to purple so that we can stay open. Um, what about pushing back dates to two weeks beyond winter break as the very first date to consider so that if families travel for the holidays, which is likely, they have a full two weeks to quarantine before coming back to school. Um, <clears throat> also, I'd like to see the time frame between um, people coming back to school be extended a bit, not a week, maybe two weeks. Um, and a couple more bits of info and then I'll be done. Um, a schedule has not been agreed upon yet. If we want to go to a 410, we can go to a 410. No schedule has been approved. And there is an underlying assumption that at every grade level, we can split cohorts into two. We don't know that yet. We don't have classroom capacities figured out. We have big class sizes. Class sizes did not get reduced this year. And so you're making a huge assumption to say that my class can fit 17 students plus me, plus another adult if one of my students has an aide. Last but not least, what about me? I am not part of a cohort. I'm gonna see multiple co cohorts. And so I am a potential spreader among one cohort to the other. People are not talking about that. I want you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm going to meet your line. I bring in Mark Mladenich, followed by Shana Seidel. Mark, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Mladenich, and I am the president of Castro Valley Teachers Association. Over the past few board meetings, there have been strong and differing opinions on when we should return to in-person instruction. There is very little nuance uh, when it comes to opinions on returning and being a parent of two children. In K-12 schools, I understand both perspectives. What is inaccurate, however, is that teachers are somehow pushing back against the safe reopening or that teachers are not really working or that they are abandoning students by not teaching in person. Our teachers are working well into the night on weekends and meeting their, their students and families uh, through office hours and beyond every day, in addition to creating new curriculum for their students. Our goal is to keep our community safe and at the same time provide education in the face of a 100 year pandemic. Uh, distance instruction is very difficult and time consuming and the stories I've heard and what I've seen, including the incredible school presentation from Canyon at the last board meeting, make me proud to represent our teaching staff. Um, Castro Valley parents have always valued their teachers and COVID-19 should not change that. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is predictable when people gather in groups for longer than 15 minutes in enclosed spaces, it ups the chances of spreading. Wearing masks, face shields, and other PPE, as well as being behind plexiglass helps to mitigate the spread. Our CVTA bargaining team is working towards a safe reopening and are working with CVUSD to ensure safety measures um, and more in our contract, thus, uh, and thus making them mandatory for all of our classrooms and office spaces. We appreciate that the county has uh, contra uh, contracted out testing uh, for staff and we would like the district to continue researching testing samplings of our students as well. Having 9,000 untested students in our schools does not seem the safest route to go if we want to contain the spread and be informed. Um, I understand why the board wants to know when CVUSD will likely be ready, but I'm also hopeful that the board will not hold firm to any hard date as we are backsliding. Finally, um, I would like to thank you all for your service on the board, especially during the past several months. You have a, tr a tremendous responsibility to the Castro Valley community and beyond with the decisions you make. And I know that must weigh heavy. I also ask that the board and our community be patient and understanding as we work together to ensure that the 9,000 students that attend Castro Valley Unified and the staff that educate and care for them are in the safest school, uh, school possible. And just to echo what uh, Laura said, um, we can change schedule. Um, that's something that's bargainable. And so if the community is like, this will not work, or our staff is like, this will not work, we will have time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to mute your line. I'm going to bring on uh, Shana, followed by Mary O'Brien. Shana? Did I bring her over? 
No, I did not. Sorry, Shana. Are you with us, Shana? Am I unmuted now? You are, thank you. Excellent. Okay. So hi, I'm Shauna Seidel and I teach third grade at Jensen Ranch. I've been a proud Jaguar for nearly two decades. Together, my students and I are making the best of a tough situation while being safe. No, it's not ideal. It's not ideal for my kids, for me, for you, for our country. But each day we work on third grade skills and they learn and grow. I have received lots of positive feedback from students and parents, which really helps me feel better as I work hours and hours to make this successful. I became a teacher because I love children and watching them grow. Seeing them in their little Zoom boxes is not the same and it's heartbreaking. It also breaks my heart and wears me down to hear the negative feedback from the Castro Valley community and even some within my own Jensen Ranch community. It is both demoralizing and frankly offensive. I became a teacher to spend my days with my students, not to shirk my responsibilities, work half time or hide behind a screen. This viewpoint is unfair and untrue. I take my job seriously and responsibly. It is my responsibility to keep myself and my family safe. It is my responsibility to keep my students and their families safe. I can do that while we are all at home and safely distancing ourselves from each other. It's not the fault of education or teachers that we are in this situation. Don't rush to reopen. Instead, slow down to put safety first. I share the idea that we should continue to explore other options. Yes, other models. I was on the planning team that originally suggested the AMPM model and now I disagree with it. Yes, we worked hard to create a plan. However, if it's best to change it, then change it. I have been working on campus by choice. I see no possible way with the current janitorial staff that our school can be cleaned in the given time frame. And what about us? If all students are on campus, then all teachers are on campus. Our school has 400 plus students, but was built for 200. How can I work safely on campus? We have a very small adult workspace where our copy machines and are located and only two adult bathrooms. How can all our teachers work safely in one and a half hours in the same space? I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that I'm terrified of this next step and hope you will consider my thoughts as you plan for our health and safety and future. Thank you, Shauna. I'm going to meet your line. I'm going to bring over Sarah Raymond. My hand, nope, my hands moved. Sorry, Sarah, you're farther down the line. Um, uh, Mary's next, followed by Netta. Mary? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, um, so I'm the parent of a fourth grader at Chabot Elementary. Um, I, I, I am excited for the kids to get back to school um, safely. Um, I just was a little confused about the different schedules. I, I've heard a lot of them thrown around like A, B, A, M, P, M, and I wasn't sure if we had landed on one or not, and I, I didn't see anything on the website. So um, if you guys could communicate a little bit more clearly what the different options are and, and when that decision would be made um, so that we could you know, plan ahead for that, that would be great. Um, I wanna echo some comments that were made by a couple of other parents. One that I agree that the 11th is a little bit soon. I am eager for the kids to be able to be in school as long as it's safe, but I do think that people are gonna be getting together over the holidays and, and having a little bit more time for some quarantine um, is a good idea uh, rather than starting the 11th. Um, and the other comment I would like to make is that um, I don't agree with the concept that if we're in red and we open the schools and then we go back to purple, that the schools should stay open. Um, I believe that if we go back to purple, that the schools should close um, because I think that would be the safest for our teachers and our kids. Um, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to meet your line. I'm going to bring over Netta, followed by Liliana. Yes, hi, this is Netta. Please proceed, Netta. Thank you. I have um, a lot of different things that I wanted to uh, bring up. Thanks again to the board and the district for um, this information. One of the things I've been really frustrated about 
is how can parents decide about whether or not they want to send their kids to the virtual academy or to the hybrid school when we really don't have enough information to make those decisions. We have not seen enough detail on exactly what this safety plan is. I have friends with other districts, they were given videos of walkthroughs through the school before they made decisions about things, a day in the life type of video where you see what's going to happen when a child enters the school, what's going to happen in the classroom, in the restrooms, and, and um, all of that sort of stuff. It would include the, the uh, survey that's going to be taken in the mornings and the thermometers and all of that stuff. We haven't seen any of that. Just like the last parent mentioned, you go to the website and you just can't find the information. It's not transparent. And we need straightforward information to make these decisions we need to consider a change in the schedule. It doesn't make sense to say that we can't change the models because people have worked on them for too long if they aren't safe enough. I really, really beg the board to dig deep down in your hearts. I know how difficult it was to vote on that in the summer and a lot of us did not agree on those schedules and you guys said that you would still be discussing it. And you know, if those models are not safe, we can't open school with those models. It's time to rethink something else now before it gets even later and later and becomes more difficult. And other things, questions we don't know. What will close the school? What health tier will close the school district? What closes a class? What is actually considered close contact at the schools? Will my school with its old AC have a HEPA level air quality filter or not? What will drive sending a child home from school? You know, all of, how can we make these decisions without the answers to these questions? They seem pretty basic. You know, we should be asking questions in the surveys, like, were you directed to be in quarantine at this time? Is someone in your household waiting for test results? Straightforward questions. Please, please, I beg the board, do not select, do not agree to a date at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Netta. I'm going to mute your line. To bring in Liliana, followed by Michael Kuziak. Liliana, are you with us? Hello. There you are. Please proceed. Hi, actually, my name is Alma Tejeda. Um, I am a parent of an 11th grader at Castro Valley High. So I actually have two questions, two questions and a comment. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to all the teachers and the board members and everything that they've done for our kids to be able to, to do virtual learning. It is very trying, of course, but again, all, we're on, what did they say? It's, we're in it together. So thank you and kudos to all of you. First of all, now I actually have two questions. One question is when you start letting the children go back to school, have it be January and I know you're starting with the SPED kids and then it's gonna be moving to the sixth graders and the ninth graders and so forth. After those kids have been in school, how long after will you be allowing everybody else to go back to school? Would it be a couple of weeks, three weeks or how is that going to be? And then my second question is actually um, from a, another parent. She said, is the Castro Valley Virtual Academy going to take electives at the school site? Does anybody have a question on any of those two things? An answer on any of those two things? Well, we, all, we can't respond, just so you know, FYI. Okay, well, that's, that's really all I had was just those two questions and then the thank you comment. Thank you. Going to meet your line. I'm going to bring over Michael Kuziak, followed by Cheryl Fletcher. Hi there. Hi, please proceed, Mike. Thanks. Uh, this is Mike Kuziak, uh, parent of a fourth grader at Chabot and a sixth grader at Creekside. Um, thank you all um, for all the work that you're putting into this. Um, one thing I noticed today, um, a growing year's day, care, day camp and after school program 
announced today that they'll be shutting down in January. And uh, one of the crises that I, I think that we need to give voice to is childcare. And I know that there's been a huge tension um, with regards to our, our schools and childcare during COVID. Um, so as, as we think about these, the, the, the new schedules and we think about AM, PM and how, how it could work, uh, I, I think it's important that we think, how can we work with other agencies, whether it's Alameda County um, or other partners uh, to think about what can we do to help fill those gaps, even though it's not CVS USD that, that, that's responsible for these things, but knowing that we're at the front line where this is really impacting parents and families disproportionately. We're in this state of failure, not because of Castor Valley Unified, we're in the state of failure because our, our national government messed something up. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that we're at where we are now, but I think there's also a huge opportunity that we're all hopefully going to see in the coming year with support uh, for schools through our state of California and the federal government to support us. I just wanna echo Netta's comments. I thought they were on point about trying to understand um, what does a school day look like? How will, how, my, how will my child be welcomed at school? Um, what, what will those protocols be? I, I do think we need to have a clear sense of that as a parent. Um, and I, I just would close with saying, I, I hope we can revisit, and I, I, I hope that doesn't uh, prevent the board from, from making meaningful uh, actions, uh, meaningful progress tonight. But I, I think some of the assumptions we made when we were talking AM, PM, um, and the different models last summer, um, again, were from last summer. Um, I, I am concerned that we're not looking at the 410 as, as a possibility, or even considering, considering different models where it's an outdoor school model or different ways to learn. Um, I, I hope we can sort of de dig deep for some, some creativity, but also um, think about how things have changed with the, the information we have. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much for all that you are doing to the staff, to the teachers, to the board, to the community. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to meet your line. I'm going to bring in uh, Cheryl Fletcher. And just so the community knows, we're past our time of 45 minutes. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these last 25 hands, um, just so that you know, um, that's going to bring us to over uh, 70 minutes, um, as long as the board's okay with that. Just want to get a thumbs up. Okay. All right, so I will bring Cheryl over. Cheryl. Cheryl, are you with us? Cheryl? And um, while we're waiting for Cheryl, I just want to say um, uh, to Amy, I've got to write down the remaining of the names. There's a couple of people that popped up. So let me write them down before you lower hands. All right, I have all hands written down. And Cheryl, I'm gonna um, look, I'm going to take you off, but um, I will ha ask you to come back. So I'm gonna um, lower your hand and then ask you a little bit later. All right, and at this time, I will be um, asking Dylan to join us. Let me pull up Dylan. Dylan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dylan Steinberg, a father of a first grader at Independent Elementary. Um, thank you all for the hard work and thoughtfulness you're all bringing to this process. Um, I should say that I'm someone who strongly opposes opening schools in January. Um, however, if the board does does decide to pursue in-person learning, um, I want to use my time to encourage you to seriously reconsider the AM PM schedule for elementary schools also. Um, I understand that it was a ton of work to come up with that schedule, and so it's tempting to say that the ship has sailed, 
The problem with saying that is we didn't have a clear picture of how COVID transmits when we decided that schedule. Um, I wanna make sure that we don't ignore the science because we find it too time consuming to rethink the schedule. When the AM PM option was first proposed, we all believed that sanitizing services was the primary way to prevent infection. And having an hour between classes seemed like it was enough to still do a staff to go through and clean rooms. But the thing is, we now know that is wrong. The science is clear that COVID primarily spreads through the air on um, its droplets, its aerosol, and it stays in the air for a long time. So given that, um, I honestly think it's crazy to go ahead with a schedule that puts students gr groups in the same classroom with one or two hours apart, sharing the same airspace. Um, given that many classrooms don't have adequate HVAC systems to truly clear the air, what we really need is a schedule that gives enough time for the virus to dissipate between student groups. Um, I think it's comforting to imagine custodians going through and cleaning desks, but most experts say that isn't the key to stopping COVID. And what matters most is the air and preventing airborne transmission. So with that in mind, I'm hoping that the board will take the time to consider using maybe an AB schedule for elementary schools or something like that. Um, I liked hearing about some of the different creative possibilities we could explore. I just think that if we separate students by day, that naturally leaves time for the air to clear out, and that matters. Having the air clear out between groups is how we stop a super spreader event when a child with COVID inevitably comes to school. So anyway, I hope you will take the time to slow down on this decision making because seriously slowing down really is how we do it safely. I just don't see us doing it safe if we're rushing forward because we think it's too challenging or too hard to revisit a decision we made without really the science you know, that we needed to make our decision. Anyway, thank, thank you very much. I know this is a really tough time and I appreciate how thoughtful you guys have all been. So thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Going to meet your line. Now this is gonna be interesting. I have two Julias, so I'm gonna click on a what Julia and see if it's you that wants to talk. Julia, would you like to speak? By the right, Julia. Hello? Hi, Julia, would you like to speak? Hi, yes, I'm one of Thank the you. Julias. <laughs> <laughs> Got the right one, please proceed. Okay. Um, hi, I'm a parent of a child at Independent. I also want to thank you for all your hard work. I know this is not easy. Uh, like everyone, I want us to return to a normal school as soon as possible, and I really wish we could reopen now, but wishful thinking just can't be the basis of reopening, and I ask the school board to vote no on the reopening plan presented today and consider an alternative timeline. Um, I, I just wanted to point out in yesterday's New York Times summary, uh, there were three points that really clearly made the case why we should not reopen this winter. The first was that more Americans are now in the hospital with COVID-19 than at any point during the pandemic so far. Indoor venues account for 80% of new infections, according to their report. And Dr. Fauci estimates that most Americans will be able to receive a vaccine by the end of April. So in other words, we're entering the worst point of the pandemic so far. We know that the worst way COVID spreads is through groups indoors, but we also know there's a light at the end of the tunnel with a vaccine. I know things aren't as bad here as they are in other parts of the country, but it's precisely because of our more cautious pace and restrictions that we're not in the same place that other states are now with overwhelmed hospitals and skyrocketing cases. It's wishful thinking to imagine that we can put kids in classrooms in winter and not increase COVID transmission. And I think it's wishful thinking to think young kids will be able to follow social distancing and mask wearing guidelines that many adults are unable to follow. I know how hard childcare is right now. It's been a struggle for our family too. If that's a concern, I feel like the district should focus on developing, uh, helping develop solutions to that. If we reopen only to have to close again, our current daycare arrangement and our family would no longer be an option because it relies on elderly family members. And I know that's the case for a lot of families. I also understand the concern about our kids' need for social interaction. I worry about that too. But I think that it's wishful thinking to imagine that our children's social and emotional needs will be met by a masked and social distance school day with no contact, recess, or play. Um, just on a personal note, I'll end here. Um, our family got all got COVID back in March and our two kids had almost no symptoms. And if we had followed the guidelines in the reopening plan, they would have been allowed to go to school and they would have been contagious. And mostly I'm concerned about asymptomatic kids infecting their teachers, parents and grandparents. My husband and I were very sick for over a month. Both of us got pneumonia and I had to go to the emergency room. And eight months later, I still have post COVID syndrome and have not fully recovered. And I know it's worse for many people. And the reason I'm sharing these personal details is just to remind you that this is not ab abstract. It affects real people in our community. 
I wouldn't wish this disease on anyone. And I don't believe it's justified to open our schools in winter at the peak of the pandemic, especially when we can save lives in Castro Valley by just waiting a few more months when there will likely be a vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I'm glad to hear your family's okay. Thank you. I'm going to bring on next Stephanie Matthews. Okay. Please proceed. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for all to, especially to the teachers who are on this call. If they can spread the news, there are definitely plenty of parents who greatly appreciate the sacrifice and the the amount of time they're putting in, as well as the school board and all of the other people and staff working at the schools and um, to put this stuff together. So the school board as well and superintendent. Um, I did want to say, like another parent. Um, the high school does not have a fully virtual model. They have model that is virtual if for some classes, but not for all. So there are a lot of students that do not have an option to go fully virtual. And that's been an issue I've raised a number of times. Um, and there's been no discussion about how to remedy that. My daughter's choices are you can continue with your classes as another parent mentioned um, and put yourself at risk and, and you know, others at risk, like myself, who is, um, I had a kidney transplant, so I am very high risk. So you can put yourself and your family at risk and go back to school to maintain your class load, or you need to drop your classes and figure something out next year um, or the year after, or whenever that may be. Um, I don't think that's particularly a great model. I, I do have a number of concerns, as another parent mentioned, this is airborne. What are, the, what are the repercussions for students who are not following the mandate? And I'm especially thinking of the older students who have a real disregard um, for keeping their masks on. I've been at the school a number of times with my daughter uh, to pick up supplies, to lock or clean out last year and saw kids taking off their masks, kids not wearing their masks, kids not social distancing. And this is a small number of kids in a line, not uh, all of these kids in the hall who have been wearing their masks for a number of hours now. Um, or who need to take a drink and have to take their mask off. These are, these are questions we still don't have answers to. I would like to, um, to ask as well that please, we reconsider these models and this time frame. It was my understanding that school wasn't going to, e this wasn't even gonna be discussed until January. The high school came out and said, hey, you need to make a decision and you have like a week to a week and a half to figure out where what your kid's gonna do with no real guidance. And I don't think that's very fair. Um, I feel very badly for those parents that need their kids in school, but we need to think about having kids that are alive and, and here next year um, over getting back to school right away. Thank you, Stephanie. We're going to meet your line. And next we will bring up, I have the name listed as Hurst N. Hurst and please proceed. Hurst and are you with us? All right, Hurst, we're going to mute your line and I will try um, Cheryl and see if she is ready to speak now. Just want to give her another chance. Cheryl, Cheryl Fletcher. Cheryl, are you um, able to speak? Want to make sure you have some time if you're available. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please proceed, Cheryl. Glad we got you. Oh, okay, good. I can't hear myself, so as long as you can hear me, that's good. Um, my name is Cheryl Fletcher. I'm an STC teacher at the high school. And the, uh, there's four things I'd like to address. The first is um, the start date. I agree with those who've uh, put out the idea that starting it that close to the end of the holidays is probably a bad idea with everyone traveling as they are. The second is I think that the idea of staying open during 
or, or in whatever period we might return to a purple zone is really ill-advised. Um, I think our purple zone would be a good deal higher than the rate of COVID that we had when we left school. And the idea that we would wait to see what happens means we'd wait to see till people started getting sick, whether we close. Um, the other thing is I take exception to the idea that uh, SPED students uh, have uh, uh, more difficulty with distance learning. I don't know that there's empirical evidence to that, um, to speak to that. Uh, it just seemed like a convenient assumption. And I don't think that they should be made guinea pigs. Finally, and most importantly, I've three times asked the board or the district or admin or whatever, what accommodations will be made for SDC, FLS, or life skills students whose parents don't want to send them back to school. They're not being allowed to go to the virtual academy. I've talked to parents, what are their options? Um, I've been told, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll think about that. We'll do something about that. But I haven't heard a thing about it. It keeps getting uh, brushed under the, the carpet. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you, Cheryl. We're going to meet your line. And I will try Hearst N one more time. Hearst N, are you with us? Hello. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes. Yes. Hi. Thanks for giving me another chance. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Yes, uh, my name's Norman Hurst. I'm a physician and epidemiologist at UCSF and a parent of two boys in the Castro Valley Public Schools. Uh, I spoke to you a month ago and recommended that you not substitute your judgment for that of our state and county public health officials and that you resume in-person learning when they give you the green light following all of their recommended precautions. Today, I'm glad to see that you have a plan to do that starting in January, and I want to express my strongest support for approving this plan. So what's new in the last month uh, regarding school reopening? There's been good news and bad news, mostly good news. First, the bad news. We all know about the third wave of the epidemic that was widely expected for this time of year. We're seeing some of that locally, but fortunately milder and starting at a much lower levels than other parts of the country. If this gets out of control here, our public health authorities will dial things back appropriately. We have every reason to trust that these professionals know what they're doing. There'll be plenty of time between now and January to see where this latest wave is heading. But how about the good news? We now have more experience with school reopening, both here from other schools in the Bay Area, from your pods, from schools around the country and internationally. The data are clear. With proper precautions, reopening schools has simply not been a problem. Well-managed settings like the clinic where I see patients and properly set up classrooms are not how COVID spreads. It spreads within households and between households when people get together or congregate without proper masking and social distancing. Keeping our schools closed won't do anything to help that. We've all heard the horror stories about the college reopenings gone wrong that wasn't because people couldn't figure out a way to set up a classroom safely. It was because of things that happened outside the classroom. I'm glad to hear teachers and their representatives speaking today. All I can say is let's not be paralyzed by unreasonable fear. It's in times like these when we show who we really are. Let's work together. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hurst. We're gonna meet your line. And I'm going to bring in Roosevelt Chang. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to also, like Norman, speak up in support of approving having target dates for when we return. I think it's really important that we keep the understanding that that approval is conditioned on what our public health officials speak and say, and that those of us who want to support that are by no means giving up that right to say, oh yes, just mow over whatever Alameda County Public Health might say come January. My experience is mostly in the biotechnology sector. And when drug candidates enter trials, a manufacturer plans for the eventual launch of that product. They don't plan out of hubris. They don't plan because they think they know better. 
They plan because a successful launch of any drug requires many steps. And they have to do that in parallel while the FDA considers their application. So they plan so that patients can receive new therapies on day one of approval. And I imagine that's why most professional organizations plan. I imagine that's what vaccine manufacturers are doing now so that vaccines can be available on day one of approval. And so I want, and I hope the board can understand that planning means that we can be ready because not planning and not having a date, what you guarantee us is zero chance of being ready, zero chance of being able to reopen. You guarantee us that we will be caught flat-footed and unprepared. And let's remember the equity, when we say about equity. We are supposed to be an education institution. I thank the teachers who are working. I love the two teachers who teach our children. This is not about them not working hard. This is not about teachers not caring. But 80% of the survey respondents did say that they were concerned about the academics of our program. And above all else, we are an education system. Our job is to educate and we should be educating. It is not a gap these days, it is a chasm. It is a chasm by all accounts. So please put the date down to plan. And for everybody else who's listening, wear the damn mask. Please put on your mask and protect everybody that you love and everybody you don't love. Thank you. Thank you, Roosevelt. We're going to mute your line. And next we will have Sarah Fetter. Sarah, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, so good evening. Um, I know tonight's meeting is specifically about the proposed phases. Uh, however, I feel it's important to continue to share my serious concerns about the way special education has been handled through this pandemic and the details included in the reopening plan around special education. IEPs and legal timelines are already not being followed. Communication with parents has been largely non-existent and parents are left on their own to muddle through the struggles all while their student is unable to access their education. How will these plans be different? How will these plans be implemented and who will be held accountable when they are not? I reached out to school board members to share my concerns about special education and the inadequate surveys sent out after the last school board meeting. Only one responded and that was to forward my concerns to Superintendent Amadi. Her response essentially dismissed my concerns about the lack of support special education families were receiving, claiming that families communicate directly with case managers, teachers, and administrators at the site to address concerns. I asked if she had confirmed that this was actually happening because that narrative does not match the experience of families with students in special education that I have spoken with. I didn't receive a response. This isn't new. Parents of students with IEPs have been sharing their concerns with the district administration and the school board for years. Nothing has changed except that COVID has amplified the existing inequities. Concerns are written off, excuses are made, and no one is held accountable. We're tired of it and our students deserve better. It is ultimately up to the school board to ensure that the priorities and values of this district are being upheld. You can't legitimately claim to be a champion of all means all when at least 10% of the student population isn't included in those efforts. How will the district ensure these future plans are followed when they aren't ensuring current IEPs and plans are being followed? These plans are meaningless without transparency, follow through and accountability. I'll also add that I share Dot's concern and many others about the models chosen. I understand that shifting gears would be a considerable amount of work, but a lot of time has passed and it seems important to revisit that discussion to ensure that the chosen plans are the, still the most appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We're going to mute your line. We will bring in Jess Paul. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. All right, thank you, Trustee Whitaker. Uh, I'm a parent of a third grader at Chabot. Uh, I'm a husband to a public high school teacher in another district, and I'm actively working on COVID response here in California and overseas, both as a public health practitioner and as a professor. So I, um, 
I feel I've got the unique position to look at this, uh, these issues from multiple perspectives. Um, I'd like to remind us all that we're in this together, that we have a common opponent uh, and it's not each other, but it's this virus that we're fighting for our kids, our teachers, our families, and uh, a voice that's not often heard our, our broader community here in Castro Valley. I recognize that today is largely about making a decision around timing, but I really feel that the decisions that parents need to make uh, and even the confidence that parents and families need to have uh, as we step back into this transition to in-person learning is really about the implementation. I think we've heard um, really good comments around this from Netta, Mike Kuziak, and, and a few others. Uh, you know, in particular, I'm interested in three things. Um, one is ventilation, in particular, since we have opted for elementary schools to go for an AMPM model. Uh, the second is data transparency, how data is shared and at what levels. Uh, and third is what criteria we have for um, shutting down if we have to, whether that deviates from uh, county mandates or otherwise. Um, you know, I, I really do think that timing matters, but so do all of these other aspects about how it's actually going to be executed. I understand that that is part of this um, current negotiation uh, between the district and teachers. Um, I just hope that that information is shared with us as soon as possible. I want to say a special thanks to Trustee Theodore, who has um, constantly and consistently promoted public health while also kind of getting all sides of this. Uh, and also Julia, who I don't know for her selflessness, um, you and your whole family got COVID, but you're still fighting for what's right for the community. Uh, I'd also like to offer in closing, because this is what I do as a profession, that I'm happy to be a resource. Um, Y'all can reach out to me and I'm happy to do whatever you want pro bono. Thanks. Thank you, Jasper. I'm gonna meet your line. We're going to bring over um, Vanderbilt family. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, well, I just kind of want to reiterate what Cheryl Fletcher had said. Um, my daughter goes to Roy Johnson and we were not given the uh, virtual academy option and we don't plan on returning and we have not been told what our option will be, just that it, we will have one. So at some point, I hope that we do get the information on what happens for our virtual 100% learning. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbilt. We're going to mute your line. I'm going to bring over Larry Brown. Hello, Larry. Are you with us? Can you hear me at this point? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. And I think the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank um, the teachers, the counselors, uh, the administration, and the board. Um, I know this is a lot of work that you guys are all going through and we parents do appreciate it. Um, I, I, I hope I, tonight you, you're gonna make the decision as to approve the current plan or, or push it out some or start earlier. And I hope that any decisions that you're making, the number one decision or the number one thing that's in the back of your mind is safety for students, to everyone on campus and the parents at home, the community. Um, and that the key point is avoiding illness or worse, including death and, and long lasting uh, conditions. Um, another point that I'd like to bring out is lunch periods. Um, if there are masks, I think one of the, uh, I guess there, there has been discussion about the various models, AB or 10-4, um, lunch does increase the level of visibility because at lunch and eating, masks come off and people will be together and that's a, it's airborne, so that's a good way to spread it. So I hope that's a consideration. And then I guess um, one of the other thing, one of my other points is um, how have the, the trends and the conditions in Alameda County in California and nationwide changed now compared to when the models that you put in place were. And I just got something that came on my watch a few seconds ago that said 150,000 cases today. That was the New York Times reporting that. So I, I, I pretty much 
have to assume that conditions have gotten worse as of today versus what they were when those plans were put in place. Uh, my final two points will be, I don't agree with, um, if we go back to purple, I think the kids need to come out of school. Um, and my gosh, I've lost my other point. Oh yeah, my other point, my other point is, uh, going back to the decision on those three. I think based on the fact that I think that cases have gotten worse now from when you put that plan or put those plans together, I think it might the plans might need to be pushed out a bit. So those are my points. Thank you for hearing me and thank you for all of your work. Thank you, Larry. We're going to meet your line and I'm going to bring Jen Flagg over. Jen, are you with us? I see you unmuted yourself, Jen. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you. All right, Jen, what we're going to do is we're going to come back to you because we can't hear you. And I'm going to bring over Michelle Smith. Michelle, are you with us? Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, thank you. First, I wanted to thank you all for um, giving us this platform to uh, raise our voice. And I hope that you really consider the things that we're saying. Uh, so I'm a parent of a fourth grader in the um, Proctor School. And one of the questions I have is, what is the driver for this push to move forward and open so soon when you can see that the COVID um, cases are raising um, higher than, than it has been you know, before? And um, so that's one question. The other thing, I'm concerned that you uh, want to open the schools, um, the lower you know, district or the lower school first. Um, the, those kids, you know, I, I know we have the middle school, we have the high schoolers, but the lower school kids, they have probably this whole thing with the mask. They don't have this down as the other kids would. But I, I really, at this point, don't want to see any of the kids, you know, back in school. Um, you know, this soon. I just think we really need to kind of consider pushing the date out. Um, not that we don't want to have the kids back in school, but it's just too soon right now. And my other concern is you all mentioned 75% of the parents, you know, want to have their kids back in school. I really doubt those numbers. I really do. So I don't know where you, we haven't seen that data. We, we only can believe what you're saying. Um, the other thing, what is your plan for if you open and a teacher gets COVID? Uh, what's the backup plan for that? Do you just shut the class down? Is there another teacher that goes back in? What, what, what's your plan for the contract tracing? Um, then you talk about um, having the AMPM situation where um, I don't believe that you have, um, we have like one, what, or two janitors maybe at the school um, where you have a, something in place where they can really clean in between those times. So that's another thing. Um, and so I'm just really concerned about that. And I just echo the thoughts of everybody, just don't rush to reopen and really reconsider. Um, I think really this school year that we're in, we just need to kind of just, I don't know, hold fast and just really just consider keeping the school uh, as is, don't bring them on site and let's just finish out the school year and consider you know, opening in September of, of next year or August. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We're going to meet the line. And I'm going to try Jen Flagg one more time. Jen, are you able to speak with us now? Jen, we still can't hear you. Just want to give you another minute just in case. Jen, I'll do this. While you work on your speaker, we'll bring you back at the end. I'm gonna mute your line. And we'll bring in Bonnie Frey. Bonnie. Oh. Hi, Bonnie, please proceed. Okay. Um, simply, I am not ready for my son to go back to school. Um, he is an 11th grader. And 
we have comorbid conditions and we're older and I just don't want to take the risk for our family for my son to go back to school while the national rates are increasing. People are going to be gathering indoors more. The holidays are going to be bringing people together. And I don't feel like I have enough information to make proper choices for the safety of how school is going to be held, what the HVAC system is going to be like, what the crowding is going to be like. We know the high school is already very overcrowded. And the thing that my biggest concern is, is that I don't feel he has an option for getting a good education with the virtual academy, which is my only true option to opt him out into now. He is an advanced student. This would curtail uh, the pathways that he's on, curtail his options for AP classes and advanced classes, and really affect him very negatively. Um, I know there's a supposed hybrid model, but I'm not really sure what that is, nor did his counselor really make that clear, I guess, because maybe it's still being discussed. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the medical issues, but I can just say that high school students make some very bad choices sometimes. And uh, they don't always mask and they don't always separate. And it's a, it's a very risky situation for us. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. We're going to meet you, your line. We had a Mallory, but I do not see her. Um, Jennifer, are you with us? Hi, yes. Hi, please proceed. Okay, so uh, I'm a parent of a third grader in Chabot. And like others who've commented today, I strongly support the goal of reopening in January. Uh, the district has put together a robust safety plan that includes measures such as screening, universal masking and sanitation, all of which will significantly reduce the risk of transmission within schools. And I would like to uh, provide a data point. Um, New, York, New York City has reopened schools um, for several weeks and after three weeks of reopening, out of over 16,000 staff and students tested, there are only 28 positives, 20 staff and eight students, which were appropriately managed and dealt with. And so I think that should give everyone some comfort that with robust safety measures implemented, schools can reopen safely, um, you know, even, even uh, when there is a community transmission. But I, I do wanna echo um, some other parents that, that I was a bit surprised that schools can stay open if the county slides back to a purple tier and um, I'm also concerned about the fact that there is transmission that uh, comes from asymptomatic individuals and via the air. So, you know, I think that raises a couple of points. I, I think teachers and staff need to be empowered to enforce masking requirements uh, from their students. I, I think without having that empowerment, it, it would be difficult um, to um, stay open safely. Also, I, I want to echo um, the need to have robust testing of the school population as a whole. I, I do know with appreciation that there's testing of teachers, but um, I, I think a, a good safety plan should include testing of students as well. Um, that would be really important to catch and manage outbreaks. Um, so I, I would want to urge the district to implement regular Sentinel uh, testing of students in each cohort and to be able to actually catch and trace these outbreaks and manage them uh, in the school. Um, and, uh, you know, other things that I, I wanna bring up, I, I also wanna echo uh, comments from other parents that, um, you know, COVID, it's now known that COVID spreads through the air. So I, I wanna consider, um, you know, ha having students eat their meals outdoors, for instance, that would manage some of the risks with that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. We're going to meet your line and I'm going to bring over Paula American. Paula? I'm here. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, 
I'm speaking as, I'm, you guys know I'm a teacher, but I'm speaking as a parent and I'm a parent of a high school senior. And as another parent said, there is nothing more important than knowing that my high school senior is safe. Walking across that stage is not as important as knowing he's healthy. We don't know the long-term effects of COVID because it hasn't been around long enough. But we do know that parents, that I feel for the, the lady, Julie, who was speaking, knowing that they had it through their whole family and she's still suffering from back in March. Those are not things we can put in front of the school opening. I feel like our districts wants to push this opening date. So in case we fall back to red or purple, we can stay open. I was shocked to hear our superintendent say that. We will stay open if we go into purple. That is absurd. I mean, I can't believe we would stay open. We are worse off than when we closed in, in March. The cases are going to climb as families gather for during Thanksgiving. We know these families will gather. That's what they do. Kids will come home from college and we know these college kids are not being safe. Just like now we're higher because of what happened over Halloween. It's gonna be higher after Thanksgiving. It's gonna be higher after our winter celebrations. It's gonna be higher after New Year's celebrations. People are not doing what they're supposed to do. And it's not just in Castro Valley, it's throughout the world. We can't tell people you can't travel, but they will. And we have asymptomatic people who aren't purposely spreading it but they will, and that will impact our entire community. I just don't think it's worth the risk to bring our kids back and say, we're not closing even if we go into purple because we're open. I sat in and listened to the Alameda County Office of Ed say the same thing Monday, the day the numbers were going higher. And I just feel like let's just open so we can stay open is the attitude of Alameda County Department of Health. And I just wanna remind you guys, you are the stewards of our school district. You are responsible for making sure we open up safely and plastic partition is not safe. The virus does not hit a barrier and disappear. And no matter what plan you choose, your teachers are exposed every single day, which means your children are exposed every single day. That's all. And I'm sorry, this is a decision you guys have to make. Thank you, Paula. We're gonna meet your line. We're going to bring on Sarah Raymond. Sarah? Thank you so much. I just want to um, reiterate everything that I've heard in the comments today. I actually don't, I, I can't say I've heard one thing that I disagree with. I want to kind of bring home, however, the idea and fact that the AMPM model that was decided on back in July before we had good science on these issues is not going to be safe based on what we now know about how COVID spreads. We didn't know this in July, but we know it now. Please reconsider this and implement an AP model for our kids and teachers. Refusing to reopen this discussion of, of the, the model because it is going to be too much work and because the staff has already put in hours and hours and is getting gray hair over this, um, as, as was shared with us by Superintendent Amadi this evening, is dismissive of both the concerns of parents and teachers and ignorant of the science and very real health concerns that we have as our community. If you're worried about being tired, take a nap. If you're worried about gray hairs, go get a hair appointment, but get back to work and please revisit this. Stop dismissing the repeated concerns that you're hearing about the AMPM model and revisit the decision that was made so long ago. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Sarah. We're gonna mute your line and I'm gonna bring in Yuzel Ponce. Yuzel? Yuzel, are you with us? All right, Giselle, I will bring you back later. And we will bring in Karen. Karen Cormier, are you with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking Sarah Raymond who just spoke because I echo your concerns 100% and think it is somewhat irresponsible of this school board that we elected to not take into consideration a new model because it's too hard or it's too difficult or it may take too long. 
Your goal is to protect our students in our district, both their education and the safety of those students in the classroom. I would ask you to reconsider the models that have been put in place for the elementary students and reconsider how we safely return back into the classroom. COVID is never final. COVID changes and shifts. Even our public uh, guidance institutions like the FDA, the CDC, and the CMS, who I work with on a regular basis for the job that I do every day, um, have been changing on a weekly basis how they handle, how they manage, and how they recommend um, manufacturers of vaccines, testing, and how we live our lives to, to change on a regular basis to keep all of us safe. Have you even considered or looked at other districts across the country? I have had the opportunity to work with the Cambridge School District, Yale University, University of Indiana, and a number of the Boston area universities who have been all successful at being able to bring their students back on campus and keep them there. One of the main elements that has allowed them to stay there is screening and testing. Not the screening that's being suggested by the school district of symptomatic students that have temperatures, but the screening of students using models such as saliva-based antigen testing and PCR testing, which gives a definitive yes or no, whether or not that student, teacher, or staff member should return to campus and be able to stay on campus based off of their true status um, of, of COVID infection. I too want to bring my students back. I have a student in high school, one in the middle school and one in the elementary school, but I would ask you to reconsider the start date until there are safer, more effective screening models that have been put in place by the district that will truly keep our teachers, our students and our staff safe. They are our greatest assets at this point. They have been working beyond the normal working hours of the day to be able to support our students. And I think that we're failing them now with the testing and the screening processes that have been put in place. It also saddens me that we're going to go and take our students and make them stay in school, even though the, our public health officials are closing down our restaurants, closing down our normal daily life, but our students are still expected to show up at school along with our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I'm going to meet your line, Karen. And we're going to bring in um, uh, Jesse Lilani. Hi, can you, can yes. you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, so I have four kids, three different schools. I have two at Cache Valley High, one at Canyon, one at CBE. Um, and I just wanted to, I have a little list here. Um, the way that the cohorts, the schedules with these three schools are set up, uh, my grandmother's 83 years old. She's the one that has always taken my kids to school for me. And because of now COVID, she's high risk. She can't do that for me anymore. So it lands solely on me to get my kids to and from school. And now I've had to switch my work schedule to graveyard shift in order to get my kids to school when they go back. And I'm literally going to be driving all day with, with, with how things are set up. I'm not going to be able to sleep. I mean, it's not feasible for, for a working parent to go back to work with, if you have multiple kids in school or even with one kid, it's, it's hard. Um, I do want to say that my family had COVID back in March. Um, mine, I was sick for over six weeks. It turned into pneumonia. I was extremely sick. It trickled down by age in my family who, you know, was just as sick, if not less sick. My son that's in middle school is asymptomatic. He had it and he had no symptoms. He goes to his dad's house every other weekend. They go to parties, they do their thing. He's spreading it because he's asymptomatic. Nobody's talking about how to protect them, themselves from asymptomatic kids or people. Um, I think that's a huge concern. I, I don't understand why we can't wait until after there's a vaccine or at least I mean, I don't understand why we need to go back to school at all this year. You're talking about possibly pushing it back to March. That's only three months away from the end of the school year. It's three months away from when we're supposedly going to get this vaccine. So we should be able to just wait it out. Um, and 75% of the people that voted 
I filled out the survey and there was only two options. My option would have been, I want to send my kids back to school when it's safe, when there's a vaccine. There's a lot of whens, like someone else said before. It's not just, yes, I want to send my kids back or no, I don't. So I voted no when I do want to send my kids back to school. Thank you, Jesse. Hope you and your family are well. We're going to get Jesse's line and we are going to bring on. Julio Arroyo? Julio, are you with us? Yes, hello. hello. This is. Can, please can you proceed. hear me? Yes, please okay, proceed. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for, um, you know, after watching last the last board meeting that took place last month, it was really disheartening to feel like staff went into the board meeting without any real plan and just saying, hey, let's talk about this. And it was kicked to January to even have the first discussion. But I really like the phase in approach the staff has put together. And I think it's really um, a good concrete plan. I understand people's concerns, but that's why you have an option to go into virtual learning if that's what's best for you and your family. And I don't think national data really is relevant to what's happening here in Alameda County. The school is not going to be, the school district is working really hard and it's, it's really, um, it doesn't make any sense to me that parents act like they're not informed. Go on the district website. There's tons of information. It's there. It's in plain sight. It's transparent. They've done a lot of good job to make sure that that's ready and it's available. Um, and so I just wanna say thanks for all the work that's gone into place to, to get us to this point. I believe with all the county and the public uh, health officials um, recommendations, it's a safe environment, just the safest I think that we can get at this point, which is I think once again, it's up to each parent to make their own decision on that. And so I just wanna say thank you. I hope the board thinks about everything that's already been done, not based off a New York Times article that has nothing to do with us and really looks at what's best for students and what's best for academics. Because I appreciate all the work the teachers union and the teachers have done to get us to this point, but it's not working. It's not working. The students are not thriving. And 75% 70, of parents have opted to go back to school. This is not like the election where you can see the numbers and then not believe them. No, the numbers matter. That's what a majority of the parents have decided. And for those 25% or less that opted to stay in their homes while in, in virtual learning, that's great for them. And so I just wanna say thank you for the SAP to put a really great phased in plan that you can learn from every week. And I'm ready for to send the students back and I'm hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. We're going to meet your line. Next, I will bring in Alex. Alex, are you with us? Hi, yes, sorry. Please proceed. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for um, their hard work and um, trying to think of the ways to bring us back to school and providing the measure. I do wanna say that um, my family and I have members of my family that are high risk. And when I've looked at the website and try to understand how is this going to look for my kid, who's in elementary, who has hard time probably keeping away from other students. And I don't think that this is going to be feasible. You know, we chose the hybrid option because we want to stay within our community. And the surveys that were provided for us, which I believe like, most parents are here saying that they need to be with much more um, in-depth questions about what that looks like. Do we approve, do we not? Also, what I'm hearing is that there's 9,000 students. Is the district going to provide 9,000 tests plus the teachers? I don't know what we're looking into, maybe 10,000 tests. Um, we have prepared our family and purchased those tests at Costco and they cost for one test, $125. <laughs> and I know that next year district um, seems to be having some, is gonna have some budget issues. So just to say that, you know, um, to provide a sort of like a survey or check and say, oh yeah, my, I'm not, I don't have a temperature. I'm not feeling well, I haven't been exposed. We don't know that because there's a lot of asymptomatic um, 
people. One of them is my cousin um, who's been spreading it to other, to other people. Um, luckily, we, we haven't seen him, so he did not spread it to us. But had he done that, you know, I wouldn't know what the long-term effects are. And I wouldn't know if we would have, if some of our members who are really high risk would have made it or not. And everything is so new and it's pretty much changing on a dime from health perspectives, from, I mean, we don't even have enforced masks. Mask. In my neighborhood, I still see people without masks walking around. And I don't know how you're going to be able to enforce this with every single student. That, are you gonna hire more staff? What exactly is going to happen there? Thank you, Alex, we're going to meet your line. And I'm going to bring on an individual that is um, labeled as Galaxy Note 8. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. All right, hi, my name is Sangeetha and I'm the parent of a kindergartner, a second grader and a fifth grader at Chabot. And a large part of the reason that I wanted to call in tonight is because I missed um, the October meeting where you um, decided to postpone making the decision on reopening. I very strongly do want our schools to reopen. I believe I'm part of the 75% that voted for this. Um, and I, I just wanted to reiterate that I, I think that, you know, I, I think I, I strongly support your plan. I, I'm really encouraged by, but what I've been hearing from our county health department and by the, the, the plan that uh, you and Superintendent Amadi and all of these great people that have worked together on the plan, I'm really encouraged by the plan that, that you've put forward. I, I do believe that we can open safely and, and I, I'm so happy that we're, we're doing it, um, that we're trying to. Um, I'm also reassured by studies showing that reopening schools has not contributed significantly to rise in COVID numbers in the community. Um, I'm encouraged by schools in our area reopening and doing it well. Um, I've heard of schools in the South Bay and the East Bay and Contra Costa County all trying to reopen. And, and, I, and I really do believe that these are all steps in the right direction. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I, you know, by January, assuming we do reopen in January, um, we'll have gone almost a year without formal schooling for, you know, for our kids without in-person schooling. And I think that's been a detriment to, to at least my kids. Um, our kindergarten in particular has really struggled with virtual learning. And I strongly believe that virtual learning is just not the best format for, for the younger grades. Um, and I actually, what brought you to, I was hoping you would consider opening for the younger grades first, the kindergartners and the first graders first, and, and was disappointed that you're not. Um, and I would say too, that my kindergartner was able to return to her preschool over the summer and, and was able to do it for a few weeks without, you know, as long as, long as they pro followed safety precautions and um, that included social distancing, masks, um, and they were able to successfully reopen over the summer and, and that encouraged me as well. And the emotional difference, the state in her emotional well-being really, really improved. So I hope that you'll continue to look at the plan and, and, and look to reopen in January. Thank you, we're going to meet your line. And I am going to bring over Amanda Santos. Amanda, are you with us? Amanda, All right, Amanda, we're going to meet your line and try to come back to you afterwards. Um, I'll bring in Sarita. Sarita, are you with us? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, this is Sarita Rasulzad. I'm a parent of two daughters at Independent Elementary. I want to thank our board, teachers, and staff for their continued incredible support. I have listened to some of our teachers speak tonight and it breaks my heart that they have been put in this position. This is our responsibility as parents and as a community to step up and show empathy and compassion. They are the ones working around the clock and harder than anyone else to ensure our kids have what they need and are set up for success. Kindness is free and we should be giving this out freely. In terms of reopening, while I want my kids to go back to school and have some level of normalcy for our family, there is no way that I would allow my kids to return if we are in the red zone. 
not just for my children's sake, but also for our teachers, staff, and Castro Valley community as a whole. I always say that we don't need a crystal ball to predict what will happen in the next two months. Sadly, we're not addressing the real problem. People are letting their guards down. Holidays are around the corner. More people will be traveling. More indoor family gatherings will take place. Shopping and indoor dining is happening. It is inevitable that the positivity case rate will increase. The January schedule is only going to now raise our anxiety level in an already difficult time as we will have to struggle to figure out how we are now going to potentially pull our kids out of school and search for alternative solutions. I understand the need to set a target date and I support this, but my ask is that we please not let our guards down while cases are on the rise this winter and instead extend the reopening to at least February so that we have a holistic picture of the impact from the holiday spread and to also ensure that we are not in a red or higher tier. Thank you for your time and for giving me the space to speak. Thank you, Sarita, we're gonna meet your line. I'm gonna bring in uh, Leanne. Leanne Wong. Leanne, are you with us? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Well, thank you very much to all the board members and also staff for working so tirelessly since March. But I wanna give a special shout out to our teachers. Um, we have, teacher has always been perhaps undervalued in normal time. And I want to send out a special thank you to not only educating our kids, but to the parents about technology, math, English, and so on and so forth. Um, I, want, I am a single mother with a first grader. Um, this is not only about our kids, but also about the health of the guardians and parents too, because if guardians are sick, they cannot take care of the family or kids and also other family members as well. We do not want this holiday to be the first, I mean, the last family gathering. Um, I echo with what Sarita, Dylan, Julia, and Michelle say earlier, is that, um, for example, the 75% response is very misleading because if the question was asked where the parents would allow kids to return in January, I'm not sure that the same response would be um, uh, arrive to 75%. And also if a model that it's not working and we know that it's not working, we need to be humble enough to change it. And also it does not make sense to me that if we are in the red and purple level, if we get there, that we keep our school open. It sounds like as if it is expected or it is okay to us for a percentage of people to get sick or even worse, knowing that the majority of people would get to go to school. Of course, the social, emotional, and also the education of student is very important of our children, but having them alive is even more important. In regarding the transition of the staff, I understand that it, it takes planning, it takes time, but the parents are being put in a position where, okay, make a decision by December um, so that when school start, perhaps in January, you'll be in a different program. But Every time there's transition, there's hub evil in the whole family. So when January rolls around and, and there's no transition, um, we're back to square one. And also I question about the quality of um, their daily life of student as well. So are they gonna be just sitting in a fishbowl for three hours or whatever hour a day? What would their quality daily life would be? Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. We're going to meet your line and I'm going to bring over Jenny Robles. Robles, sorry. Jenny, are you with us? Please yes, proceed. I'm here. Great, please proceed. Hi, yeah, I had a question um, just about the, I get, I mean, I, um, I appreciate the work that everybody's put in, that the teachers have done, the administration have done. Um, I guess going back to some earlier points is just clarity on the reopening plans. What shuts down a classroom? What shuts down a school? Um, and then in terms of opening and closing, going into the red and purple tiers, um, if a school like say fourth and fifth goes back and then we somehow the county goes into purple, do second and third go back? Does uh, K one and two go back? Is it the school or is it the grade? Do we have to freeze in place? Um, so yeah, just a lot more clarity is what I would ask in terms of um, parents knowing what to expect 
um, when things happen, when things come up. Um, and the teachers too, I guess. I mean, but I'm really speaking from a parent perspective. Um, those are my main questions is, you know, just clarity around that. I'm looking forward to the day that my kids go back to school. I think they are too. Um, although we know that going back to school this year will look very different. Um, but just clarity so that we all know what to expect on, and how to work with the system and through the system for their success. Um, those are my main questions. Thank you, Jenny. We're going to meet your line. And I'm going to bring in Marze. Marze, are you with us? Yep. Hello. Hi, please proceed. Hi, uh, my name is Ted Crocker. I'm Marzi's uh, husband. And um, we, uh, we have a son who's 14. Um, we also have a daughter, 26. Uh, she's a teacher. Uh, Marzi is an administrator at a college. Uh, she has an older son that works a lab in a college. Uh, but we have a 14 year old son who used to love school. He now hates it. He's been depressed. And in the last two months, he's uh, developed full blown OCD. And for those that don't know what this is, it's uh, basically a life sentence where it's not about washing your hands, it's fear based and uh, it's devastating. Um, and we, very much believe that it's the situation that uh, has developed because of COVID and not being able to attend schools that has created this for our son. Um, I'm not hearing a lot about mental health in this discussion tonight. And I believe it's a huge uh, development. And I've talked to doctor friends and nursing friends and uh, especially eight to nine year olds, uh, there's a sharp uh, increase in mental health issues among that group. Um, I have a, uh, my best friend lives in Florida. His wife is an elementary school teacher and his daughter is in middle school. They started, uh, opened the schools that both of them are in, in uh, August 10th. And as of now, they've had no COVID cases. They have all the uh, precautions in place and they're following them very well. And I, like I said, this is elementary school, this is middle school. Um, and usually I think of them as not being able to follow rules as much as maybe high schoolers. But uh, like I said, they've yes. had no cases. Um, uh, we believe there's enough knowledge out there such that schools can be as safe as going to the grocery store, which we all do on a regular basis. Uh, we sympathize with the teachers. Like I said, we have a teacher, but uh, mental health is paramount for our son. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. We're going to mute your line and I'm going to bring over Sandra T. Sandra, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, I just also wanted to thank all of you, the board, Superintendent Amadi, so very much. I can't even imagine how much extra time and love and care and listening you all have put into this. And as um, a, someone who has also reopened a school, helped to reopen a school two different ways, I can really empathize. Um, I'm a parent of a second grader and a ninth grader in Castro Valley, and I'm also a teacher in Castro Valley. Um, I'm also, myself and my son also have um, asthma, so we also are at high risk. I wanna say that I do strongly support reopening the schools in the hybrid model. And I wanna say that with robust safety measures, um, I think that not enough has been said tonight, um, like the previous caller about the, um, what our children are actually suffering. Um, during what, what, we're, what they're having to do. And I think I, I so empathize with all the parents speaking here tonight. Um, you know, it, it, my heart goes out to anybody who's at high risk and anybody who has suffered. I mean, really my heart goes out to you. Um, my heart also goes out to all those families, so many who aren't on this call, who both are working full time, their children are falling behind, their children are suffering social emotional um, issues that they would not have suffered had they been in school. Um, it's really, it's challenging to walk that line and I don't envy anyone who has to make those decisions, but 
Um, I personally feel that I trust our professional and, and health department guidelines. I trust the, that the school district will put into place the, the correct safety protocols that are recommended. Um, um, I want to urge everyone that the number of cases that you hear every day, 50 times a day, is not the total picture that all these professionals look at that we're taking the advice of. Number of cases is just one data point, and I know all of you probably have personal experiences that's not just a, a case, but um, the reason why 75% of parents want their children back in schools um, is because they are struggling, their children are struggling, and they can see huge gaps forming and you know the social emotional one is the one that's the most worrying because um, that is something that is hard to catch up on. I believe children can catch up on academically but the social emotional will you know can remain. So I just have a few suggestions. I, I agree with the start date being pushed back two weeks. I want robust testing, mask over the nose and mouth at all times. And I'm done and I have more. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sandra. We're going to meet your line. Um, we have three people that I'm going to check on before we go back to the board, just to see if they um, are now able to unmute. So first we'll try Jen Flagg. Jen, were you able to unmute? You still we want to give you a chance to speak if you're able. All right, we will move on to Yuzel who may or may not still be with us. Is not with us. And now we will try Amanda Santos one more time. Amanda? Can you hear me? Amanda? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. I apologize. I didn't realize I was on the speaking list, but I will absolutely use this time. Uh, my name is Amanda Santos. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Van Oy, and as much fun as it's been to have our pets on Zoom and things like that, there is nobody who wants to go back to school more than our teachers. Um, it, it's not fun to sit there and see your 10 year old students struggle to put documents together or ask them to do a Google slide when you know that this is certainly not the best model of learning um, for any age group really of student. There is no question that, that this is productive. The question is, is it safe enough um, to go back to school? And I agree with several people before us, the data is there that supports that, sure. Um, my real question is, are the safety protocols in place at our school to maintain those safety protocols long-term um, until the end of the school year when you have factors um, like small kids who, you know, as many people said before, adults are having trouble following um, the safety precautions recommended. So it's, it's very unfair and unrealistic to expect that all children will do that as much training as we can provide to them. Um, I think at the very least, you know, our district can work harder. There is no question that our teachers and our staff um, and board members have put in countless hours over this, but I don't think that this is the best that we can do for our families. Um, for example, we need to provide more PPE to teachers, especially our special, special education teachers who no question will be within close contact with their students in order to serve them properly. Um, and those students who will go home to families who have high risk members. We're not getting protective shields as far as I know for our classrooms. And I'm unclear on whether or not the new air filter system I got in my classroom really will be um, of that quality to be protective for not just myself, but for the students. So I think at the very least um, school district and myself included, we need to go back to work to explain more precautions to our community and how we are gonna keep their students safe. Um, and I think that a two week boundary after the winter break is very fair. Um, as much as I want to go back to school, I absolutely want to make sure it's safe. And I don't think that our work is done yet um, in explaining that to families and students as well and to protect our teachers at the same time. So thank you for all of the work that you've done, but I think we still have more to do. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for going to meet your line. Um, we don't have any more public comments. Um, and I will bring it back to Parveen Amadi, but before we go back, I just want to thank the community for uh, speaking up and sharing your voice. We are all collectively facing this pandemic together, and we hear your individual losses um, that each of us are all facing, so we want to recognize that as well. Um, Parveen, again, we normally don't respond to comments. However, given the situation, uh, there were some couple key things that uh, were brought up that I think it's important to note and to um, respond to. Uh, 
I'll say one is the safety plan. Um, there's a lot of information in there that people talked about that, um, you know, ventilation, PPE, things like that. And then there was another comment about going from red to purple. And if you could speak to how that's the county's uh, guideline, not ours, um, that would be appreciated. And then getting information across and back to families. So a lot of people talked about how are we going to know what the school looks like or are we going to, you know, how, how are the teachers and community going to be informed of different things? I think that's um, pretty key to cover. Um, so if, and then um, again with testing. So I'm going to hand it back over to you so you can respond. Actually, I'm uh, thinking that we probably, the board members and staff need a break. If you want to take a five minute break first before. Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry. And then I'll get started. No, that's okay. Is that Great, what you so want to do? Wait, does the board want to take a break? Let's see a thumbs up if board wants. Okay, great. So we'll be I back know. at uh, 638. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Praveen. No problem.
And for those of you waiting on the line, just as a reminder, we took a quick break and we should be shorting in a minute or so. Thank you. Let me know when to get to start. I think we're waiting. I think all the other people. Yeah, we got a couple more people. We're all back, but I want to give us our full until 638. So that way, in case any public ran to get refreshments or other things that they have time to get back in time. Looks like we're at 638. So we will continue. Thank you for the short break. Um, Parving back to you to respond to some of those comments. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'm, um, I'm really thankful. I'm grateful to some of the folks in the community who have actually read through our plan. And I know it's over 40 pages long, extremely detailed to every point, all based on exactly what the health department has asked us based on their guidance and science. And I know that not everyone has had an opportunity. So I would ask all of the folks who asked about safety, PPE, what happens here and what happens there. I would ask that you please take a look at that plan. And if you have any questions, what, after you look at the plan, feel free to email us and we will answer any questions you have. Our plan is comprehensive and complete. And our plan is based on all the guidance from the county. And when we do get ready to reopen, I have to turn our reopening plan, again, with all the details of dates and times and what grades and all of that, to the county to be reviewed. So again, there will be another set of eyes on it. But we have developed it page by page, word by word, with our county office, County Department of Health Education guidelines. So I ask that you look at all of our plans because much of the questions about safety are all in there, including what if, what if this happens? What if there's a case? How do we track? How do we trace? How do we enter? What do we do if someone is sick? What do we do if, if, if a teacher is sick? How does um, lunch happen? What do we do with restrooms? Every piece of what needs to be in place is in that safety plan. So um, I really encourage everyone. I know everyone's busy and I appreciate um, that folks are dealing with a lot. So maybe they haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, we have everything that's required in place. Um, what is not required by the state or the county is testing students. Although we're looking for ways to provide opportunities for people, not through the district, but to find all options for just as much as we can for anybody. But it is not required. What's required we have put in place. And I want to say um, a couple of things about this whole idea, and perhaps I could have done a better job, when I said there was a lot of work that went into this plan and the model, I didn't mean just how much work went into creating it. What I meant is all of these weeks and days and hours and minutes, we have spent time putting the plan, the safety plan and the protocols that you see are based on those models because the changing of that model changes much of what we have put in place. And I'm gonna have Dr. Ryman talk about those models a little bit, 
Um, one of the things that came up um, was that the schedules have not been agreed upon. And there was a question, is this bargainable or not? The board decides programs. And if there is any impact, the impact is bargainable. We don't bargain programs and things like that. So the board makes a decision. And based on that, if there's any work that needs to be done, then we work with our teachers union. Uh, Dr. Bees, if you wanna just jump in really quick and then I'll go back to a couple of other points. Yeah, as I had said earlier, we have spent hours and hours on the elementary plan. And in fact, we have been working with the union literally bullet point to bullet point on the elementary schedule th so far. Uh, there's been a ton of input. Uh, we've made changes based on their interest and input. And like I said, we have we've made very, very minuscule changes because that's what mattered to people and they wanted those changes. So uh, please know it's been a collaborative and thorough discussion with the teachers so far. Yeah, and we have everything that we are supposed to have in place. Um, so just a couple of um, other things, um, again, protocols about parents and what happens and some of the uh, parents actually, uh, you know, brought up a good point about like training families and how do we hold people accountable. Those are all in our safety plan. And we have all of these trainings and videos that we're actually putting together to help families. For example, not just students, but also families and, and screeners and, and anything you can think of that, that we need to put in uh, place. Um, ventilation, uh, criteria for shutting down if um, something happens, testing. We already have uh, our contract, as I said, for testing already. Cleaning, all the cleaning procedures that we have had in place and are practicing are based on the models that we've had. Um, so one of the other things that, P, uh, that you wanted me to um, share before I go to Dr. Ryman is, this question about being in purple and being in red and, and if we are in purple. The county says that if we have already opened and we are in purple, we do not have to close. Again, that depends on what's actually going on inside the school and the district and classrooms. So even when they say you don't have to, they may say this school has to close. Also, they're not saying you don't close. They're just saying you don't have to, which means that's a decision we would make. If it's purple, districts can actually close, even if they have open. They're just saying you don't have to. So I think that's a really important clarification to make. Um, I um, wanted to, let's have uh, Dr. Ryman talk a little bit about um, in response to some of the questions um, that came up. Before we go to Dr. Ryman, well, I was going to let Jason go first, but go ahead. I wanted to ask my question before we move too far away from, from what a question is. Um, so, you, Parveen, you talked about, um, somebody talked about training and parents, and Candon put together that wonderful video with the three uh, 360 views of, of campuses um, for their incoming sixth graders. Can we do something like that at all of our campuses? I, I feel like parents would be a lot more confident if they could see what what all of those, um, all of the implementation of safety measures look like. Um, and and so we also have learning hubs happening now. Can we can we show parents what the classrooms look like? Um, there's a lot of things that have happened that we should be proud of and show off and help to help give our community some confidence that this can be done safely. Yeah, we have pictures of the hubs in the classrooms mm -hmm. already on the website, but these are the kinds of things we want to put together. We've already looked at videos mm -hmm. that we're going to create from washing hands, from touching the doorknob, to all of that, and that's gonna be a part of it. And, and absolutely, we could do those things. Those are things, that's why we need time a couple of weeks before people start kind of sending these out, doing a lot of training for, for families 
to make sure that they're comfortable. So that's a great idea. Um, and, and we're gonna, I, we're gonna I, do that. I've seen the pictures online of the learning hubs, but there's something to being Not able to video. be around the room and, and to have a better feeling of what it what it's like to come onto campus and, and yeah. to, you know, greeted with a health screener and that kind of thing. Yeah, so those are things we need to put in place before we get started. But right now we're just kind of talking about this, but that's a good idea. So we will do that. Um, Dr. Ryman. Thank, thanks, Superintendent Amadi. Um, I just wanted to speak to uh, some of the questions that came up earlier in terms of the different models. Uh, the board made a really good decision this past spring, uh, along with Superintendent Amadi, in terms of giving us direction to begin exploring models sooner rather than later. Uh, what that's meant is that we were one of the first school districts uh, to arrive at models for the elementary and secondary levels. Uh, and since that time, we haven't stopped planning. Um, as Dr. Beats indicated, uh, and uh, Ms. Chan could share as well, the facilities department, human resources department, and educational services departments have all been working in collaboration with our collective bargaining groups to pour through every detail in terms of what makes uh, the particular models that we've selected as safe as possible. What will the needs be as some of the parents asked? What will the needs be of staff? Uh, how will students move between different locations? What does contact tracing look like? How do we conduct food services and transportation? How do we serve students with disabilities? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, changing models at this juncture would mean going back to square one uh, and giving up that advantage that we have in terms of safety of all of the planning that we've done. Um, We've also, it's also allowed us to move forward with opening hubs earlier than most school districts because we're in, a, in an advanced position in terms of that. Uh, additionally, I wanna share uh, some of the questions from the public. I, I want to reassure folks uh, that the people who are doing the planning, uh, the overwhelming majority of us are parents. Many of us are parents with students in this school district. And we're thinking about what we would want for our own children. Uh, in some cases, it is our own children that we're thinking about uh, who are impacted by these plans. And so we really are thinking about safety first and foremost. So we have looked at the various models, including the 10-4 model, which I know uh, a lot of people were interested in, uh, that really sprung up from an article in the New York Times. Uh, and there's a think tank uh, that also brought it up is an economic recovery model, um, which really depends on staff members also uh, being off at the same time as students. Um, and so we want to be able to implement models to full, uh, to their full effectiveness. Uh, and we really have explored all of those models. Um, and so to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any data um, that, that would demonstrate that any of those models have a significantly uh, improved impact on safety. If there was, we certainly would be looking at those things. If there was something, uh, we do share across the county all of the information that we have and that we're receiving in educational services. And the same is true for each of our departments, human resources, as well as the facilities and maintenance and operations, as well as at the superintendent level. So we're constantly looking at the different models. If something new comes up that is substantially safer, uh, I can guarantee you, we will be exploring uh, that model in that sense. Um, also the uh, question in terms of uh, making sure that staff members have everything that's required for them to be safe. Uh, throughout this process, as Dr. Beats was sharing earlier, <clears throat> we've been meeting with staff, uh, including smaller groups of staff members. Uh, sometimes we're talking uh, two or th three people that may be in a particular position with specialized needs. Uh, and trying to drill down and make sure that they have the support that they need and that they're safe as well. Um, so I do want to, to put that out there so that people don't think uh, that just because we proposed something in the spring, um, that that means it's sat there. Uh, what it's allowed us to do rather is to dig in and make sure that we're increasing and improving the safety uh, for all of our students. Yeah. So just to, before we hand it over to you, I think um, 
you know, the questions again, please check our safety plan, especially for our staff. We have been, we have had staff and we have all of those things in place, PPE, all of the things that we have, uh, that we need to put in place. But I, I mean, there is, so again, I'm gonna reiterate so that we don't go back to the, to the conversation uh, because of a comment. Again, all of the things that we have put in place in our safety, based on the health department guidelines and direct contact and conversation with them has been based on what we started in July. So all of those things, when I talk about the work, that's the kind of work. I, I will end it there and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. Again, just like Dr. Ryman said, people have children, those who are involved in this work. Some of us who don't have children in school also have family members who are at risk. We understand we've had family members who have had COVID. Nobody's taking it lightly. Um, and if, if somebody just followed us around from our facilities department to business, to student services, to everybody, they will see that we are doing everything we possibly can for the safety of the kids. Again, I wanna say, nobody in, this, in the country can say, we, you come in to the store, you come into this company, you come into the school, and I guarantee you will be safe. We are minimizing infection. We don't wanna mislead people, but our goal is to keep you as safe as absolutely possible. So um, with that, if you have any other questions, let me know. Dr. Hendricks? So, you know, I have two kids at the high school. And so I have, a, a, um, I see it every day, the struggle that they, are facing and you know my senior has lost his senior year um i have so many thoughts i'm probably going to ramble a bit because i get how hard this is i mean it, it's impossibly hard not a single one of us here takes opening or closing schools lightly it, it's a sucky situation that we find ourselves in I do find a lot of hope in the fact that we have had our learning hubs open now for about a month and they've been running smoothly. I've gone to see several of them in our district and I see students that are um, able to focus and do their work. Staff that have um, put in place safety procedures that, um, that look right and feel right and the kids are um, healthy. Um, uh, and when we talk about making this decision now of when we're going to bring our kids back to campus, I, I think a good compromise would be to push it to the end of January or beginning of February and have a checkpoint meeting um, before that to look at where we are because if we're moving steadily into the orange and into the red or we're in the orange right now into the red and into the purple um, then we'll see that and we will make a decision at that point to go forward with the plan or not um, and I think you know if we're if we go back into purple at any time when when um, our students are back on campus, we, we decide that we come back and assess the situation for our school. We don't, you know, that it remains our decision as trustees in this district. Um, so I'm proposing that we, we do go forward with this plan because I think the timeline makes a lot of sense and how you're bringing students back and which students you're, you're bringing, where we are bringing back first, it, that makes a lot of sense, but I think middle of December, and I think I may have been the one to say middle of December at the last meeting, and now I'm feeling like, no, it, it, it's that's probably not enough time to see where we are and feel comfortable about it. Um, so that that's my proposal is that we move it, the, the proposed start date to the end of um, January or beginning of February. Did I just say December? I, sorry. <laughs> I 
I thought you meant something else. I'm like, wait, no. I totally, it came out of my mouth, but I meant January. So are you making a motion, Dot, or are you just having a conversation? Just want to be clear. I'm having a conversation. Okay. I want to hear from other board members. Great. And we had Gary and Shane, and then we'll go to Monica. Well, uh, as we all know, this is essentially an impossible situation. And uh, we know, I mean, clearly the uh, opinions we've heard from the community tonight and in previous meetings uh, range across the entire spectrum. There are parents who are adamant that they want their children back in school yesterday. And there are other parents who are equally adamant that they don't want their kids to go back to school almost for the entire year. But of course, we do want them to get back into school and it is the best thing for them. And I think the fact that Arvin and the staff have worked out a plan is a good thing. Uh, I think what we're really talking about here now is what's the best time to do that, to pull the trigger, so to speak. And you know, that's a really hard thing right now because the whole country is exploding with COVID again. And even though we are lucky to live in a bubble here in Alameda County, uh, and we can look and feel, actually I feel I'm happy that we're in a place that's um, has not too many at least cases of COVID. Uh, we don't know that that's gonna last. And this color coding thing is, is just a snapshot in time. What all the public health officials and virologists and public health people across the country say is that we are, uh, probably just beginning the worst phase of the pandemic, sadly. Um, I know Boston and Chicago opened their schools and have recently closed them. New York City, the mayor in New York City is considering now closing those schools. Um, so there are a lot, you know, it, I think we're heading into a sort of a, a very tough time. I think even Fauci said, this is gonna be a tough winter. So I like what Dot said a minute ago about deferring this plan for two or three weeks. Uh, that's one thing I like. And the second thing is really, we need to have, be able to have a meeting in January to see whether we actually do want to open. I mean, even if we were to set a time of anything tonight, uh, we're gonna need to see what happens during the holidays. All of us are very human. We've been, we all, we all have cabin fever. We all wanna see our friends and relatives. And I think the holidays are not gonna be as happy as they usually are. But uh, I don't think we have anywhere near as enough information to know exactly when we can start schools. That being said, I think it's good to set a, a time out there to work towards, uh, even though in January, we might have to adjust that again. So that's where I am. Thank you. And I'll be happy to make a motion anytime you want, Lavender. <laughs> okay, well, wait, we'll let Shane, uh, Monica, and then Dot speak, and then Joe. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I do agree with Dot's um, assertion that we should wait till the end of January, early February, specifically because I think we should really reassess where we are at two weeks after break just because that's the incubation period of it. And my main concern was that it's up, it's our decision if we move into purple to shut down or not. I think that's something that we should absolutely make a definitive decision about, like whether we're gonna shut it down if we're in purple before we send people back to school. Cause I know even just being in school when we, back in March when we shut down, it was like this hypertension and stress throughout the campus and teachers and students. Cause we all had no idea if we were gonna close, if we were gonna stay open or whatnot. So I think if anything, we should definitely decide on if we go to purple, are we going to shut down or not? Thanks, Shane. Monica? Yeah, I agree with Dot. I mean, I was thinking the same thing. It's you, you want to wait at least a couple weeks after the holidays to see what's going to happen because people are going to get together. I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to Florida this year. Um, but for a lot of people are going to get together and, you know, people are people are tired. We're all tired of being stuck at home. So I suspect that after the holidays, we will see another spike, just like after Memorial Day and the 4th of July and Labor Day, we've seen spikes. So 
I think it would be good, like Gary said and Dot said, to to regroup after the holidays, you know, around the middle of the month, whatever the first meeting in January is, see where the numbers are going, and then, you know, end of July, beginning of February, just move the phasing back a couple of weeks. Thank you, Monica. Dot and then Joe. I also wanted to add, I forgot to mention this, but in, in New York public schools right now, only about 25% of their students are actually in school. So, I mean, if you can imagine having one fourth of our students on an A day, you know, versus half of our students. Uh, so that that is probably contributing to why the, the numbers of positive tests that they've had are low. In addition to, of course, all of the um, processes they put into place for safety, but you know, they're not working with half of their students like our A and B um, models have. So, you know, just taking that into consideration and, and waiting, um, I think is, is the thing to do. Thank you, Doc. Joe, and then I'd like to say something. And then I think Parveen wants to say something. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to hear from the community tonight. The very first speaker said what I was thinking, every case is going to be different. And we heard that over and over again, that every family's decisions are personal and important. Um, and we need to take that into consideration, which I believe we tried to do that with the survey. And, you know, I've done surveys dozens and dozens of times for different organizations and to get almost a 50% response was pretty terrific. So I feel a little bit like that deserves consideration on our part. Um, I also was a little bit disheartened by um, some of the comments about transparency because I really feel like the staff has worked very hard um, in putting together that roadmap. And you can go to page 11 and you can see what it looks like when a child comes on campus and stuff. So we need to work really hard to make sure our community knows that it's there and um, that they can um, participate in that conversation with us. Um, and I wanna say something about the decision that we made in July in that I made that decision and I voted based on what I believed was the best educational plan for our students. And um, I don't see anything in the data or the science that has changed the educational needs of our students. And I really believe it's important that, as one of the speakers said, we're an educational agency and we need to be focused on what's best for the students' education. So um, I, I do believe that the plans that we made and they were based on a great deal of input from our professional educators, teachers, um, counselors, administrators, um, that that was the best thing to do for students. So I think that's important. And then the last thing, I just really need to say something to the governance team. And I'm really disappointed in the continued disregard for the established board protocols of hearing the staff report, hearing from the community, and then having board discussion. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to say something. Um, and then we'll go to Parveen and Gary. Um, so I do want to thank um, the thought that was put into uh, the different phased in approaches. So I really, I think having that guidance is really important to me. You know, we, there is a, was mentioned of social and emotional supports um, from our public. And I know that we didn't talk about it today, but we've been talking about it a lot um, because it's very important to us. Um, and, you know, that transition from elementary to sixth grade is such a huge transition. So I really appreciate you being mindful of that. And same with freshmen. I mean, we've seen the data where freshmen drop off a map and it's just, you know, they're, they're, they're out. 
So we want to make sure that we address the needs of the population and, you know, talking about special education, making sure that their supports are there. Uh, it's very important. So I, I really like um, the, the phase in approach that was provided to the board. I like it a lot. And as we did talk as a board before, I mean, we've been talking about, I hate to say this, and I'm a Game of Thrones fan, so I'm sorry, but winter is coming, <laughs> right? We all know this, it's coming, people are gonna gather. And so yes, there is gonna be that heightened hazard. That's why I, I wanted to preface before we started our meeting that you know, no matter what we decide tonight or don't decide tonight, that we are dealing with a global pandemic and things are going to change and we will have to adapt and modify as things change. And so I, I do like the idea of pushing out a little bit. Um, that way it gives us a little more insight into that, you know, people have come back from whatever holiday they're in. They've social distanced for enough time to know whether or not that wave is gonna come back really high. Uh, so I like that. And lastly, I just wanted to thank uh, the work of all the teachers um, and the staff uh, that they put into this because this, you know, safety plans aren't easy. I do them professionally for work. So <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Um, so appreciate all of your thought uh, and thoughtfulness. Um, Parveen, over to you and then Gary. Yeah, um, thank you for all of your comments and discussion. I want to say um, the, that the safety, I think Dr. Ryman also mentioned, the safety aspect of those models were absolutely considered in that decision. But I want to say this, whatever decision we make, I really have to ask that we stop second guessing. And as soon as we, you know, they're, they're, and there are always gonna be new ideas. Somebody over here did something. Somebody over here is doing something. Once we make decisions, you have to know that we don't take that lightly and we go to work. So whatever decision is made, we need to stick with it. Obviously, again, we understand. That doesn't mean that if there are safety issues, we would not stop or move things around. I keep saying that it's all predicated on safety, on the fact that we stay in this health order. So I'm, I, the work that people have to do is not light. And I know we constantly want to make sure everyone is included. I want to say our principles have bent backwards. And I think there needs to always be recognition of the leaders at the school site. There also needs to be recognition of our amazing classified folks who have volunteered, who are the ones who have volunteered to come into our hubs and have had everything that they've needed to protect them, but they volunteered. Our bus drivers who are driving kids back and forth so I wanna thank everybody. And obviously we have said over and over again, and we will continue to say that in our teachers, but our families need support. Our children need support. Their social emotional well being is at stake. Nobody wants to rush. I am not interested in bringing anybody in before we have all the things in place and before it's the right time to bring them based on science. So. If you decide to move two weeks later, we can easily adjust that calendar and keep it just moving it over, one week over, two weeks over. But what I ask us to do is in January, on January 13th, I believe we have our board meeting, is that when we come back, we don't start all over again with some new things that people say, well, we didn't read this, we didn't have that. So I have to just say, it's a bit frustrating for us that people have not had a chance yet to look at the plan, even though it's been posted. So I'm asking that whatever decision you make, that you respect the fact that we are gonna get to work on it. And that when we meet in January, it's not, I want people to be clear. We're not gonna start all over from step one. We're gonna see what is working is there any new information from the health department that has changed anything? If not, then we move forward. And again, if we go into purple, 
that's a decision that you need to make. If, if it's purple, we shut down. And if it's not, we continue. Thank you, Parveen. Gary, you had your hand up, please. Yeah, I was happy, I am happy actually to make a motion that we use the plan that we have, but that we change the date to begin on February 1st, which will be three weeks out. And that would give us a couple of meetings in January to make sure that the public health situation is appropriate to actually open on that day. And, and if we have to change it, we will. Uh, but it would be it'd be nice to be able to open, and we all want to do that. But I think giving us another few weeks there. And then I would also, I mean, I would make that motion to just shift by three weeks. But I would also ask Parveen, um, right now the secondary and the elementary schools are separate there. And I would wonder if you might want to still open the secondary schools in fe earlier in February rather than staying on exactly on this schedule. I mean, um, there may be good reason why you want to phase them in, um, but yeah. So my motion is to, to keep it as it is, but I would ask that question of you, and then I'll modify my motion if I need to. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I actually, I would uh, love for Dr. Beats, Ms. Chan, or Dr. Ryman to jump in, because I think a part of it has to do with the, the fact that we wanted to phase them in so that we have enough time in between for us to kind of get things in place and not rush and not have too many all of a sudden at the same time. But maybe I'm, maybe you want to add something else. Susie Chan, I think has her. No, I just want to second the motion so we can have discussion on it. I'll, se I'll second it. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Sherry, Jason. Sure, I, I was just going to reiterate what uh, Superintendent Amadi was sharing, and that is that the idea of a phased of approach is twofold. One is uh, first and foremost to learn from whatever happens with the first group um, and have it be a smaller number of students so that we can make sure that we provide the, the best support possible. The second piece is a capacity piece um, that since whatever we're doing will be new, uh, this provides us the maximum capacity uh, so that we'll have enough support staff, enough classified staff uh, to ensure that things are as safe as possible. Uh, obviously, I, I think Ms. Chan could say more than me about that. No, um, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Ryman and, and uh, Ms. Amadi. Um, yes, that's uh, obviously uh, something that we consider it is uh, want to make sure that we have um, time to, to uh, put that all together and also allow for the, um, you know, the uh, elementary to, to look at that uh, since that's our focus as far as uh, arranging our classrooms, making sure that all of the proper signage and all the PPE are there. Um, so yeah, so I just, um, that's all I wanted. Yeah, and from a negotiation standpoint, uh, we have been focusing on elementary for the last several months. Um, we meet, like I said, we meet weekly and have been discussing that rollout, that plan in detail. We are going to start with secondary, but we're going to need the time to do it. Secondary is much more complicated. Um, there are more students and um, they are very social individuals who like to be close together. So we really need to focus on how we're going to come up with a plan um, for the secondary level and, and finish up our negotiations or you know, finish up our details and our negotiations. The elementary kids will be easier to start with. Great. Yeah, and our, um, our goal is to finish the secondary and all of that before we go on break. Otherwise, we're going to be behind. And I think the, the important piece is um, we, the secondary, we wanted to just be very thoughtful about the stages. But if we start on February 1st, I believe, um, it will probably, by the time we have our secondary, it will be the end of the third quarter. Um, I believe around that time. I'm not sure because there will be one week in between. So 
if the if the motion is start on February 1st and follow this schedule, that makes it a lot easier for us versus starting all over again. And we just kind of move it forward. So if we have a, a motion uh, and it's been seconded. So I just want to make sure that, that if there's any other board comments, I want to allow that. And then what, one last thing <laughs> that in January, when we come, we're talking about the date and the phases, not everything else that we go back to square one. <laughs> Thank you. And Gary, you had your hand raised? Sorry, I'm just trying to get a, a mute there. Um, my only, my only uh, reason for raising my hand was to say that I, I'm glad that my motion can stay the same. And I hear the rationale that's been suggested here by the full-time staff and sounds reasonable to me. So I would say let's move on. Thanks. Is there any further discussion? All right, the motion um, has been moved and seconded to start the plan that was recommended by um, staff and teachers uh, starting February 1st instead of the uh, proposed date. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Given that, this is our only agenda item for our special board meeting. I wanna thank the community again for joining us this evening. I wanna thank the board, staff, and everyone who put this plan together. So thank you so much. Good evening and have a safe night. Goodbye.